Okay, just give me, it, it takes a minute on my end. Gotcha. Okay, uh, looks good on YouTube. Okay, okay Rich, let's take All a roll. Good morning. Welcome to the public hearing, public meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission for April 28th, 2020. I'll call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson. I'm here. I'll call. I'm here. Sarah, it doesn't go yes. on. Commissioner Lefty. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Just know for the me? record that, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just noting for the record, Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Bland are like, recused from this item. It's not good. All right. Good morning and welcome to the April 28th public hearing and public meeting. This is our second virtual meeting. Um, this hearing is, and meeting is being held via Zoom yes. and will be, will be simultaneously uh, live streamed on our YouTube channel. The public can only view this meeting via the YouTube live stream. Any member of the public who wishes to testify can testify by downloading the Zoom app and entering the meeting ID information or by calling the phone number that will be displayed on the YouTube video for our hearing items. We will be admitting people to the Zoom meeting to speak only when their item is being presented. Anyone who uh, wishes to testify must follow the hearing on the YouTube live stream in order to join the meeting. Um, the meeting information will be on the screen at the time that we uh, begin an application and at the time that we begin the public testimony. And if you're testifying on more than one item, you will need to rejoin the meeting each time. Um, when you enter the waiting room, please be sure that your name is spelled correctly so that we can properly identify you as we call you to speak. And um, once we admit you, you will have three minutes to speak. And please begin your testimony by stating your name again for the record. Um, and please also note that there is a slight delay between each of these transitions. So uh, just give it a few seconds before you speak. Um, the hearing is being transcribed, so please speak clearly and not too quickly. And, um, you know, it, note that with all of our hearings, we will accept written testimony if it is submitted to the office before Monday, before uh, by Monday, before the hearing at noon. Um, and we strongly encourage people to send it by 5 p.m. the Friday before the hearing so that we can share it with all of the commissioners over the weekend. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it to Corey Harala to begin our day and our agenda. Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to start today's Preservation Department agenda with a public meeting item. This is item number one, LPC 20-04617, uh, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Manhattan, Lot 1265, Lot 50, and 40. Uh, 610 to 625th Avenue and Rockefeller Plaza, the Rockefeller Center, Channel Gardens, Sunken Plaza, and Rockefeller Plaza Individual Landmark. An Art Deco style office, commercial, and entertainment complex comprising office towers and public spaces designed primarily by the Associated Architects and built circa 1932. The application is to alter fountains, stairs, monuments, concourse level storefronts, and hardscape mm -hmm. features. Uh, this was last uh, presented at the public hearing of January 14th. 2020, no action uh, was taken at that time. And commissioners, please note that at the public hearing of January 14th, 2020, there was a consensus of support among the commissioners for components of the proposed work, including at the Channel Garden Pools, the relocation of the Credo Monument, parapet modifications and railings at the stairs down to the Sunken Plaza, 
as well as summer stairs and roadbed and paving changes at Rockefeller Plaza. However, some commissioners did ask that the applicants restudy certain aspects of the alterations to the sunken plaza wall openings. And most commissioners also asked them to restudy the alterations to the north and south gardens to maintain or better recall the geometries, edges, and water features of the existing gardens. Uh, so with that, the applicant team is here to present their revisions to the proposal. Okay, and before we turn it over to the applicant team, I'd like to ask Commissioner Holford-Smith to make a motion to open the proceedings, if you don't object, so to allow the applicant to speak. So moved. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, and we'll just take a, a vote on opening the proceedings to allow the applicant to speak. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so now the applicants may go ahead and present. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning and for enabling us to connect virtually. Uh, I'm E.B. Kelly, and on behalf of Tishman Spire and our entire team, uh, let me begin with what is most important, which is that I hope all of you are safe and healthy. Uh, these are, are difficult times for New York and New Yorkers, and we thank you uh, all for continuing your important work. Uh, this morning, we are going to present a beloved symbol of New York, a place we think of as the heart of the city, Rockefeller Center. As the New York Times said in its fitting virtual tour of the center just a couple weeks ago, with New Yorkers self-quarantining, Rockefeller Center conjures up the promise of life returning to normal someday and the unshakable glory of the city. It is our aspiration that Rockefeller Center in 2020, much as it did when it was first built under much more difficult circumstances, symbolized the strength, perseverance, and beauty that is New York, a place with a storied legacy and a vision for the future. We seek to restore the original intent of the public realm by offering a grand and welcoming entrance to the center. With your support, this is work that we would begin this year, bringing with it much needed jobs, investment in great public spaces, and opportunities for New Yorkers to once again experience the center's grand ambitions that deliver on a human scale. As John D. Rockefeller Jr. said, I believe that every right implies a responsibility, every opportunity, an obligation, every possession, a duty. We, as the stewards of Rockefeller Center for more than 20 years, take our obligation seriously and our duty with humility. We must ensure that the center represents the best of what New York will be in this new era, and in so doing, maintain the magic of this remarkable place. We look forward to presenting our vision to you now, and I'll turn it over to Cass Stackelberg. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Evie. Cass Stackelberg, Higgins, Quaysbarth, and Partners. Um, first, let me say uh, I'm happy to um, see you all <laughs> again, uh, and it's wonderful to, uh, to have the opportunity to share these uh, revisions with you and, uh, and to be able to sort of continue the public review process. Um, as Corey mentioned, there were uh, five areas of work that we shared with you back in January. Uh, there were modifications within Channel Gardens, uh, relocation and reconstruction of the Credo Monument and modifications to the stairs, um, updates to the elevations within Sunken Plaza, uh, modifications to the North and South Gardens, and then um, alterations to the roadbed in Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, I'm going to quickly touch on and just share with, uh, share with you all a few of the images of the, um, the areas of work that uh, were not um, of concern for you all. Um, if I can get the slide to go down, there we go. Um, so uh, the Channel Gardens, um, Sunken Plaza, and, uh, and the Rockefeller Plaza roadbed, um, in part because some of the commissioners I think who are here today were not um, actually uh, in attendance in January. Um, the first, um, the first area, um, sorry, uh, the first area here on the top of this slide, so an existing view looking west in Channel Gardens and our rendering uh, on the upper right, just illustrating the changes uh, at the base of these um, six fountains, uh, which includes replacing uh, the, ter the deteriorated glass block with new uh, glass block and restoring the mirrored finish uh, that was part of the original construction uh, of, those, uh, of those six pools. Um, the, the Credo Monument installed in the 1960s right in the middle of the stair down to the Sunken Plaza 
our proposal is to uh, relocate and reconstruct it to a much more central area um, on uh, within this uh, within the channel gardens uh, to make it much more accessible uh, to the public um, as well um, um, within within the um, stair and sunken plaza area so an existing view of the stair uh, our proposal so in the springtime an existing view uh, in the winter uh, with the rink in place uh, another existing view our proposal is to to reconstruct the front edge of this stair remove this tall parapet uh, replace it with a railing um, no change of course to the size uh, and location of the rink and then this uh, modification allows us to introduce um, as Corey mentioned, what we refer to as the summer stair, which is a temporary installation, which would be used in, in the summer months to uh, recall the historic um, graceful stair that existed in the sunken plaza um, in a temporary in a temporary fashion. And then finally, um, the other element, uh, modifying the roadbed. So 20 years ago, uh, the roadbed, which had been asphalt, was reconstructed uh, and raised. There's just a four inch lip right now. Uh, which has necessitated the installation of these bollards. Our proposal is to raise the roadbed up to the same level as the sidewalks, which will allow us to eliminate these bollards while maintaining the original heavy granite curb uh, to line uh, the edge of that historic, uh, that historic roadbed. Um, but what we want to focus on today, um, of course, are the revisions that we've made based on your comments. And there are two areas of work that we want to address. One is within the sunken plaza, uh, and I'll begin our discussion um, with with that uh, with those design revisions, um, the comments um, that we heard at uh, at the public hearing in January really focused uh, on a few things. One was just a comments about the removal of the historic material and the replacement of that granite um, in kind. Uh, there were also comments about um, the the elevations becoming too porous and there being a loss of solidity. And we were asked to consider um, either adding additional uh, piers or making those piers that were included a, a bit larger. Um, so this is again a site plan just indicating sort of the area of work that we'll be discussing um, today. Um, and before we begin uh, the design revisions, I th we think it's important to just go back and look at um, this series of comparative plans, the original plan on the left, an existing plan at the center, and our proposed plan uh, on the right. Um, a few things to point out in the original plan, one perhaps most noticeable, this is at the concourse level, which is coplanar with the floor of the sunken plaza, that as originally planned, there was a very clear circulation route around the sunken plaza. Um, on the north and south sides were storefronts with um, storefront windows and doors, and on the east and west sides, there were connections directly into, um, into the concourse. There were many openings, and it was actually quite porous in its original design. Uh, the current condition has um, commercial spaces, restaurants that have grown around the sunken plaza on the north, the south, and the east sides. And what you can see is that circular um, pattern of circulation uh, has been lost. Um, in, in addition, you'll also see that there are few doors um, on the north and south sides in particular, uh, and, and a few on the, on the east and west sides. So while there is glazing on the north and south sides for a connection between the sunken plaza uh, and the restaurant space, there isn't the actual connection. So in our proposed plan, what we, uh, what we are attempting to achieve is to reclaim that circulation around the plaza, but to also uh, allow for connection from the plaza into the concourse and vice versa. So what we're really aiming to do here is to enable and encourage that circulation and that connection that was part of the original concepts of the associated architects. Um, a historic photograph from 1934 just illustrating those um, storefronts that existed on the south elevation uh, and then the openings into the concourse on the on the west side and what you can see are what actually are fairly short storefront openings seven foot tall um, but just pointing out um, that um, sorry um, just pointing out that the arrangement uh, which was fairly composed with this um, arrangement of piers flanking the openings these granite piers set about 12 inches above uh, above the openings. And so there was a, a composition to these elevations, which has actually been lost over time. Um, what's fascinating too, is that as early as 1939, 1940, all of those storefronts had been eliminated. So in an effort to um, enhance the, the connection, the visual connection from the concourse to the sunken plaza, those storefronts on the north and south sides were removed for these large glass panels. 
I'll also point out these piers, which are structural um, to support the terrace above, these were faced in glass as well, so that there was a, an emphasis on transparency uh, and visual connection. Um, and what's, what's also fascinating is that this area, um, much like a lot of the center, has evolved over time. So um, beginning in the, uh, the late 1930s, before even the center was completed, it was already starting to change. And those changes have occurred through the 20th century. And this image is actually a, a, a sheet from uh, the public hearing presentation 20 years ago, well, even longer ago, 1998, um, that shows the existing condition on the west elevation of Sunken Plaza. So I'll highlight this area and this area. And this just shows um, that at the start of this project 20 years ago, um, there were these small openings on the west elevation of the plaza. And even under commission review, the sunken plaza has changed significantly. So what was approved at that time was removing all of these piers and the granite and creating larger openings, which are there um, today. Um, a few photographs from construction in around uh, 1999, 19, uh, 2000, just to illustrate the uh, extent of removal. So this is a view into the southwest corner of the sunken plaza. Prometheus had been temporarily removed from this location. And then a detail while these walls were being dismantled and these openings were removed. Um, a view of the stair from Channel Gardens down into the plaza. Um, we believe some of these panels were actually removed and salvaged and reinstalled, but it gives you a sense of the amount of change that occurred. And then of course the photo on the lower right, just as a, a sample um, that was reviewed as part of the replacement uh, of the Deer Isle granite. As you know, um, much of that granite um, is, is, you know, it's, it's fairly unarticulated granite. Um, and some of it was, uh, some of it was salvaged and reinstalled through the, the program 20 years ago, um, but other areas were, were actually replaced. Um, so turning to the existing conditions, this is a view uh, of the north elevation um, of the Sunken Plaza and then a view south of the south elevation. So the composition that existed historically with a sort of regular pattern uh, of openings and piers slightly taller than the, than the openings themselves has been lost. So what you see here is this large glass opening with those, those piers set behind glass on the north and the south sides, uh, and then a, an array of different opening widths uh, and, and heights uh, and, uh, and configurations. Um, some detail photos. Um, so again, sort of these tall openings, this is a detail of those structural piers with glazing in front of them, um, two on each side. You'll also see, again, this sort of differential in height. So this is an original um, seven foot opening, and then this is a raised opening at eight foot 10. The piers, um, which are uh, historically taller than the openings now in many locations are shorter than the openings, and that's something that we intend to address uh, in, this, in this program. Um, turning uh, to just a, a, a um, spectrum view of, of the historic conditions, this is in the northwest corner, so the, the west elevation. Prometheus and his fountain are, are right here in the corner on the left. Um, the small openings and the piers, um, the current condition, which um, was part of the approval in 2000, which uh, eliminated the piers. Um, I'll also point out that this end pier here uh, was removed and the pier in the corner was foreshortened. And then our proposal um, to reframe this opening in piers, um, with piers, um, proportionally uh, set higher than the, um, than the existing openings. Um, and in fact, actually in, the, in our proposal, we are making this opening a bit shorter than it is today by the inclusion um, of, of these piers. And this is a bit different than what you saw before. The piers are a bit more substantial um, and have more granite to them to sort of carry a bit more solidity and, and, and heft. Um, the, again, the existing plan that you saw before with the restaurants flanking the sunken plaza, uh, and then our proposed plan with the updated piers. So again, allowing for connection to the concourse, which would uh, circulate around the plaza. Uh, doors shown here in the open position, but these are all swing doors that would be shut um, and then um, interspersed by granite piers that are three foot six uh, feet in width as compared to the ones that we showed you in January, which were two foot four. Uh, but the idea is to recreate and reestablish a sort of a regular rhythm uh, as there was historically uh, and to allow for this connection and enhance and enable that connection between the sunken plaza and the concourse. Uh, existing elevations, uh, the west elevation, the east elevation, uh, and the north and south, which are similar. Again, you can see the sort of variety of opening heights and widths that exist today. Um, what we showed you in January, and just as a just as a little note, 
when you see these tags in, in orange, this is always our, our previous proposal. And then our updated proposal shown here with a blue tag, just showing the increased width of these piers. So the piers here, which are currently faced in, um, in glass will be faced in granite um, and, uh, and enhancing or enlarging the width of these piers to give a bit more solidity to the elevations all the way around, uh, around the plaza. Um, comparative elevations, existing um, public hearing and uh, our, our current proposal. Um, and then some historic views just to show the organization of the piers slightly taller than the openings. Uh, and, and reestablishing that relationship uh, from where, where we are today to, to getting back to the historic condition. I'll also just point out that these, uh, these are all swing doors. There are vertical posts which will be fixed. So even when the doors are open, there will be fixed, um, fixed posts that are kept in place, but you get a sense of the solidity both by the um, articulation of the granite, but also of this new storefront system. Um, some details of that system, um, a series of uh, steel doors that will be painted to match uh, the dark statuary bronze scene throughout uh, the sunken plaza, um, a, a, a section detail just showing the, the recess of those doors to get a bit of a shadow line and those to, to really uh, reestablish and re restate the, the, the solidity of, of the granite. Um, and then a series of, of renderings. So this is the a January view looking into the northeast corner of the sunken plaza, uh, and then our updated um, revised view with the, the wider piers, um, more granite at the corners, more granite in front of these piers, uh, and then the reconstruction of the stair here on, on the east side. Um, again, sort of re-establishing re a regular um, width for these openings, um, but proportional um, and allowing this granite to still feel very substantial and supported by, um, by these larger piers. Um, again, looking into the northwest corner of the sunken plaza, an existing photo, different widths, different heights, um, the loss of the piers, particularly on the, uh, the inboard edge of those large openings uh, in the corners, our January view, and then our updated view, again, showing the reframing of this, pier, uh, of this opening, getting a bit shorter uh, or narrower, rather, through the introduction of these piers, uh, but reestablishing the rhythm uh, and the organization of these elevations. Um, turning to the, the North and South Gardens, um, again, uh, there were comments uh, at, uh, at our January public hearing uh, from the commissioners, um, as Corey said, regarding uh, some concerns about the elimination of, uh, of the fountains and the water features uh, and the loss of the geometry that existed. Um, there was also uh, some expression uh, about uh, the loss of the, the hard edges uh, of the curbing, of the granite curbing around the planted areas, um, and a general uh, desire to see, see some of that geometry, uh, some of that hard-edged quality, uh, and even the pools uh, be retained. So we've restudied uh, those elements. There was um, general acceptance, I will say, for the uh, stair and elevator um, and, and for their, their design and location, but uh, there was no support um, for the uh, media uh, element that was incorporated into the glazed um, enclosure for the elevators and those have been, those have been eliminated. Um, so an existing plan on the left and our uh, updated plan, excuse me, uh, our, our January plan on the right, um, again, you can see um, the North and South Gardens here, uh, the 1980s elevators, which we're proposing to remove. Uh, there are three uh, fountain elements on the inboard side of these, uh, these planted areas. Uh, we were proposing a stair in this location uh, a new elevator here mirrored on the south side um, and then uh, repositioning the flagpoles, but no, uh, no water elements inc included. Um, our revised proposal maintains the position of the stair and the elevator. It incorporates though two uh, fountains, uh, both on the north and the south. And as you'll see, uh, a, a strengthening of the edges around all the different uh, com components of, of these planted areas. Um, there was also testimony, a uh, public testimony during the public hearing about the importance of Tivoli Gardens as a source for the associated architects. And um, we, we did some, uh, some research, we looked at photographs, and we've included this view, which I think is, is telling. I think um, what we've attempted to do in our design revision is to obviously reincorporate um, water features, but to also um, look at the way there is a sort of tiered quality to, uh, to both Tivoli and the existing, uh, the existing conditions at Rockefeller Center. 
Um, collectively, though, I think what's important is this sort of picturesque, picturesque quality to these gardens, which as well, uh, we have attempted to, to restore back uh, in our design revision. Um, turning to the, uh, to the plan, so a detailed plan of what you saw in January, uh, and then our update, um, our update here with the inclusion of, uh, of the pools um, and um, the, the harder edged quality, and you'll see that in our renderings. Uh, an existing photo uh, with your back to Rockefeller Plaza looking east, you can see these pools, uh, the flagpoles outboard um, of this planted area, um, and then the, uh, the 1980s elevator uh, set right into the middle of the, um, of the, planting, uh, the planting beds. Um, the view uh, that we shared with you, uh, similar, uh, same angle from January, and then the update uh, today, and a few things uh, to point out that I think are quite significant. One in the foreground, uh, we have reestablished uh, the curb detail around all the planted areas. So there's now a, a clear distinction uh, between um, the hardscape and softscape areas where previously there was a bit of a blur of that line. Now we have a much more clearly defined edge uh, on, uh, on all the planted areas. Uh, I'll also point out here, um, the modifications here for this upper register where the trees are sort of at sidewalk level. This is now a much more clearly defined granite wall. Um, and then down here, which you'll see more clearly in some of the other renderings, um, this bench remains and then um, uh, fountains in, in this area. Um, an existing view at the terrace level. So the street is up here, this is the terrace level. And then beyond the, the railing here is the sunken plaza. Um, this is the view that we then showed you um, in January with the media art incorporated into the glazing. Um, another view, um, a longer view, sort of similar. Um, this media has been completely eliminated, so this will just be a clear glass enclosure around the uh, elevators. I'll, I'll also just point out this area where we had a sort of a low stringer in granite for the stairs coming from the street down to a landing and then down to the concourse. The new proposal uh, reestablishes this corner uh, so there's an express, uh, very clearly expressed edge um, and, and separation between this tier uh, and this tier. So the granite now will read very clearly. And then you can begin to see the fountains a bit more clearly in this rendering. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the clear glass um, elevator cap. Uh, another view now looking down sort of a, a bit higher than the, than the plaza level, but just to illustrate the fountains. Um, and so an, an effort here to obviously uh, reestablish uh, the, the, the water feature, which uh, there was some discussion about the, the, the uh, audio, the oral quality of water. Um, so we have uh, recaptured that with these two fountains on both the north and south sides. Um, looking at um, this sort of geometry, the commissioners talked about a concern about the loss of geometry in the previous. So we have now more of this sort of notched quality. And then of course, um, a very clear delineation between this upper register, the lower register with the expression of, of the granite. Um, the uh, section from January, just showing um, the sort of spilling nature of the, um, uh, of the plantings from the upper register down to the terrace level. Uh, our revised rendering, which shows more defined and, and, and clearly separated zones. I'll also point this out, the fountains will have the same glass block is the glass block we're proposing uh, for, the, uh, for the channel gardens. Um, and then continuing uh, from the street view, uh, again, looking back um, from the street toward, uh, toward the, the, uh, the sunken plaza, the elevator uh, here. Um, this is our rendering then from January. Um, again, um, looking from the street toward the sunken plaza. Uh, and then our updated rendering, which takes um, that bench, again, makes that a sort of clear um, hard edge, integrating the curbing, uh, and, then, uh, and then the elevator. We've incorporated uh, a bit of signage that just says concourse shops, which will be wayfinding uh, for those who are uh, using the elevator to understand that this elevator takes one down to the concourse. That's sort of in place of the wayfinding that would have been incorporated into the media within the uh, elevator enclosure. So we have signage on, on this side and the terrace side as well, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, uh, some details, these were sections from January and then our updated details, which just show um, this illuminated signage uh, on, the, on the outboard side of the cab. Um, 
it'll be on the on the terrace level down at this level and then up at the street level um, 180 degrees facing uh, facing the sidewalks um, as well there have been a few uh, refinements and updates to the design of the stair um, this is the January proposal. Um, as this uh, project goes into uh, development and, and um, development of the drawings, um, we're, we're beginning to detail the, the glass uh, railings here a bit more clearly. We've also incorporated some wayfinding signage here, uh, perhaps uh, backlit um, for, for visibility, and then um, modifications to the stair to make the actual uh, landings a bit shorter, which will bring some additional daylight from the street down into the concourse level. Uh, and then just looking at um, a few of these renderings of the stair, this is our January proposal, uh, again, with, with the softscape elements really sort of bleeding into the hardscape areas. And now with the revisions, um, reintroducing uh, the curbing to hold the plantings uh, in place, the curb, this back wall, uh, and then the articulation of the glazing uh, and, the, and the signage uh, within, the, um, within the stair down to the concourse. Um, so just um, finally, this is an existing um, aerial view. We think it's sort of worth sort of pulling back a bit. We've talked a bit, um, you know, about, about the individual trees within the forest, but I think it's important as we conclude to sort of step back and look at the entire forest, because I think it's easy to sort of get very caught in all the details, which of course are very important. Um, but I think it's important also to look at this, uh, look at these areas of work in the overall context of the um, of the center. So this is an existing uh, aerial rendering from um, about the seventh or eighth floor of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, uh, just highlighting the areas of work. So the Channel Gardens, these are, this is the existing condition, uh, Credo Monument, the Stairs, uh, the Sunken Plaza, the North and South Gardens, and, and, the, um, and the Rockefeller Center, uh, Rockefeller Plaza roadbed. Um, the next image is, um, is, is our uh, a, a rendered view from January and then um, our updated view from, uh, from April. So showing uh, the repositioning of Credo within uh, the Channel Gardens, uh, the updates to the stair uh, to allow for better flow from Channel Gardens down into the plaza and views from here down into the plaza area, um, uh, recomposing the interior elevations of the, um, of the sunken plaza to, to arrive back at a, a, a better composition. Um, and also the North and South Gardens, um, clearly sort of serving again as buffers from the street to, uh, to the terrace and the, um, and the sunken plaza and then the roadbed uh, in the foreground. Um, as, I, as I said um, earlier, the center, um, which was built over 16 years, uh, beginning in 1931, 32, um, in its early years, it began changing. It's always been a sort of dynamic uh, and living landmark. And, and even into uh, the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 20th and uh, 21st century, the center continues to evolve a, a, as this dynamic uh, living landmark. And I think the changes that we, uh, we have been uh, talking about both in January and again today are these carefully curated series of modifications that we see sort of tying into this changing narrative and evolving narrative of the center that are key uh, beginning in the 1930s all the way up to present day, key to making sure that Rockefeller Center uh, remains uh, a vital uh, presence and a vital landmark here at the heart of New York City. So with that, we'd be happy to take um, questions. Uh, we also have Michael Gavellini along with Evie um, as, part of, uh, as part of the team here. So um, okay. we're happy to take any questions you all might have. Right. Thank you, Cass, and yes. thank you for um, the, the thoughtful presentation. Commissioners, are there any questions? Please raise your hands if you have any questions and I'll recognize you. Okay, not seeing any hands being raised. Let me just double check. Okay, so before we move into a discussion, um, I just wanted to ask Rich if we have received any written comments on this public meeting item. Yes, we have received uh, two letters, sorry, sorry, three letters in opposition, uh, including from the Historic Districts Council, just give me one moment, um, HDC asking the commissioners to look at the location of the bronze sculptures flanking Prometheus. Okay, so um, the, the letter from the Historic Districts Council um, really just talks about the 
the bronze sculptures. So Cass, could you just address this? We talked about this in the initial hearing, but they've they've moved around several times and are now being sort of relocated to um, on either side of Prometheus, which is a location they were in at some other point in their history, correct? Right, right. So uh, this is uh, Paul Manship's Youth and Maiden. Uh, let me see if I, if I can go back um, a slide. Um, th this is our material board, which I'm happy to go back to if you'd like to see. Um, so uh, Youth and Maiden currently reside up on, uh, on either side of the, the stair at the base of Channel Gardens. And the two sculptures have actually sort of had this nomadic existence. Originally, uh, as you noted, they were constructed uh, or, or installed flanking Prometheus on the west elevation of the sunken plaza. So sort of down at this elevation here, uh, they moved to the roof of 45 Rockefeller Plaza at one time. At the time of designation, they were actually down, um, sort of stuck into the corners of sunken plaza. And then 20 years ago, they were relocated to their current location. So our proposal is to actually reposition them back to their original location, um, flanking Prometheus on the west elevation uh, in, the, in the sunken plaza. Okay, thanks. And I see Commissioner Shamir Barron has a question, so I'm gonna recognize you now. Please go ahead. Thank you, hi all. Um, Cass, can you just repeat um, and reiterate the reasoning, the rationale for um, lowering the fountain kind of corridor, um, the, just the experience of those tall walls at the, at the seated areas and fountains, um, and, and why it was that you needed to lower them as substantially as you have. Thank you. Sure. Um, should I go back to these slides or, or should we work off of... Um... Well, this, this is fine. Okay, let me, okay. So I might have, oops, sorry. Uh, I might have uh, Michael participate in that. Sorry, I'm gonna try and get back one. Um, Michael Gabellini participate in that um, in that discussion. Michael, do you want to um, do you want to address that, or should I begin? Michael, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Cass, uh, please um, please begin, and uh, I can uh, comment um, okay. after you. Okay. So I, I think uh, let me go back to the um, to the existing. It may be easier to see um, the, the the issues with this. So part of it, uh, part of the discussion and decision making, um, has been um, to uh, yes, this is the existing view is to sort of connect um, connect this uh, this edge uh, on the outboard sides of the uh, of the gardens with the terrace level. So to sort of make a bit more of a connection to allow for a better flow. Um, and so the fountains, which are sort of sunk down um, at, at, uh, at terrace level, uh, are, are sort of tucked into the front edge of these uh, gardens. And the idea has been to sort of, as I go forward, um, if I can, um, has been to make them sort of more part of the landscape and make them less distinct. Uh, and to integrate them into uh, into the overall composition of that uh, that parterre. So um, I think that's a sort of a, a general uh, a general answer. Uh, and Michael, feel free to uh, feel free to to weigh in as well. Yes, I believe uh, one of the primary um, aspects of this was to uh, create more connection and less of a very high wall when you're walking on the north or side uh, south terraces. Uh, and actually to create a parterred uh, landscape, uh, which does step down uh, from the two sidewalks, both north and south, uh, to create more visual connectedness to the uh, terraces themselves. And then also to carve out uh, the kind of keystoning, uh, notching back of the, um, of the uh, two fountains. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Shamir Barron? I, I suppose it does. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an answer. I don't know if it entirely answers my question, but it's, it's an answer. Thank you. Okay. okay, all right. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. So I think we will move to our discussion now. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank the applicants for 
again, a thoughtful presentation. And I think one of the things that came out in both the initial presentation and in today's presentation is that Rockefeller Center has this history of change from the very beginning, almost you know, within five years of its original construction, things were changing. And um, particularly the sunken plaza, how it was used, how it, it, it contributed to the original intent for circulation. And I think that this proposal today restores many aspects of the plaza and introduces new changes that are sort of in the spirit of those historic changes. And um, in fact, some of those changes, while new, restore some of the original intent of circulation and accessibility within the plaza. The two open issues that, as we heard today, that um, came out of last after, out of the original public hearing presentation were the Sunken Plaza and the North and South Gardens. And I think um, the Sunken Plaza, as we heard, has been, was altered as early as 1939 um, when the North and South elevations were opened up and, and large glass panels um, created. And that um, continued, those sort of changes I think were made to enhance the transparency and visual connection between the interior and the outside and the circulation inside. And those, uh, and the commission further approved expanding openings on the west elevation um, some decades ago. So this is again, sort of been a tradition at the plaza. And I think that what the revised proposal today does with the thickened piers is it restores um, a regular rhythm, restores some solidity where it's been removed and restores the proportional relationship between the piers and the openings in terms of their height. So I think those are all positive moves. Um, the concerns about the North and South gardens uh, last time were really about, I think there was some openness to uh, modifying them to change the elevator and the stairs, um, but there were real concerns about retaining some of the original geometry and hard edges. And I think um, that the application today does respond to those comments. It maintains a clearly defined edge and wall and a bench, and it also retains water features, which was something that came up last time. So I think um, the application today does really respond to the two aspects of this project that raised questions last time. So um, I think I'd like to go around the entire table and see how everyone feels. So I'll start with Commissioner Shamir Barron. Okay. Um, I have to say this is a, a little bit difficult for me because um, I have no kind of quarrel with the design. All, all of the design um, motivations and responses and approaches Makes so much sense uh, in terms of the you know in terms of the use in terms of um, the kind of the, the next expression of this place, and yet it's it, it is clear to me that the changes um, made to the fabric and to the stylistic quality are mm -hmm. are real. I mean the, mm -hmm. the uh, it, no matter how wide you make the piers in the sunken plaza it doesn't sort of make up for the fact that originally, um, not, notwithstanding the fact that it had been altered, it, we'll get to that, um, that originally the kind of the, the weight of the top, uh, in, in a sense that the top stone was, was much, again, stylistically, um, and, and whether it's deco or otherwise, um, was so much heavier. The openings were kind of punched, they seemed, um, sh low and, um, and and you had a sense that they too were kind of carved into um, the 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 stone the sunkenness of the stone and that has is 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 different now it's clearly much more about about opening about access to whatever is mm -hmm. underground and beyond there similarly with the gardens the experience and this and the language was one of kind of corridor, a tall, a tall garden, a tall um, rock edge, you can say, uh, to on one side. And, and that experience has radically been changed. It's, it's made to flow, it's made to be experienced sort of horizontally. And, um, and, and, and so it's different. And, and the place wasn't designated mm -hmm. for its history of change. It was designated for its 
material and fabric and stylistic qualities. So it's tough for me, but I have to say that ultimately the, the changes do not take away from the, the experience mm -hmm. of, of Rockefeller Center as we've known it and, and contribute to its, um, its um, and, you know, engagement with it. So I, I have to say I support it, but with some real hesitations about, uh, about the change that we are, um, that we would be approving and implementing. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I completely appreciate your concerns about recognizing the evolution and the history of change here. And I think it's something that um, while not designated necessarily for that history of change, I think it's something that we have relied on a lot when determining appropriateness at lots of places because it is, since in this case, it, you know, started changing and being more open at the sunken plaza since the 1939, 1940. So most of its history, and as you said, it sort of doesn't change much of, of the experience as we know it today, um, perhaps except for at those North and South gardens. So. Um, so it's interesting thought. Okay, I'm gonna move around um, to, let me see, I'll go Diana. Let me find you. Yeah, so I'll just go through um, quickly a couple of things. Um, I uh, think that in general, the restoration of the Channel Gardens, I, I can approve very heartily and the uh, moving of the uh, Credo Monument I think that the changes to the plaza in general, uh, the stairs and um, the, uh, the design which is seeking to improve circulation and connection to the plaza are all uh, good, uh, good things that I applaud. And uh, I think I can support the, the restoration of the uh, storefronts and Yes, it is a substantial change from the original, but it, it is something that over time has evolved uh, a great deal. And this is a step back in the right direction of uh, increasing the height and, or, and the width of the piers and including the steel uh, swing doors to try to give some greater uh, weight uh, to, uh, to the verticals. My biggest concerns in, uh, at the last hearing were uh, the uh, North and uh, South Gardens, um, that uh, the geometries and the water features uh, had really been lost. Um, and I think that uh, returning the water features and increasing the uh, weight and geometries of uh, this mm -hmm. uh, area are very uh, positive changes. And while I, I uh, agree in general with uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Shemir Baron uh, about uh, the fact that these changes are substantial. I think that I can support them. Um, looking at the entire project and, and how it's addressing uh, this open space, which is a very important one. Um, and I'm glad to see the removal of the media art. Uh, so those are my comments and I can support the project as presented. Great. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Holford-Smith. Sorry. Okay. Oh, Commissioner Holford-Smith, are you there? I'm here. Can okay, you great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna to stick to the two major items that were discussed um, in the re revisions today. Um, I think I was one of the people who was concerned about the loss of the fabric in the sunken garden and the uh, loss of solidity. And I appreciate the applicant um, addressing that by making the piers wider, but, but I think now, unfortunately, the proportions have gotten to be a little bit off um, in particular, this one location, um, I guess it's the east, the, actually the view we're looking at now, uh, looking at the stair, there used to be three stone piers uh, in the section of wall that's solid granite. 
and they've reduced that to two. And I think that proportion um, is, is very odd. So I think going back to the, maybe not as narrow as they were originally, but maybe a slightly narrower peer, but maintaining three on that solid portion and then keeping that width going around, um, I, I would support the other changes to the sunken garden. Um, I'm still a little more troubled by the changes to the, uh, the North and South gardens. Um, I think it's, a, it's an improvement to have reestablished the heart is. Um, and, I, and the introduction of the water feature. Um, just wondering if there's an, another way to bring back some of the original um, the feeling of solidity that the that the tall walls had, um, if perhaps those two sunken garden beds that that are producing the water feature could be the full height of the <clears throat> sidewalk level, or something to give something a little more solidity. And um, the glass rail that wraps around the stairs. Um, I think at the street level, um, it would be, it's, you know, the rendering makes it look very, very transparent, whereas now there's a, a, metal, a metal railing that wraps around that, that corner. Uh, perhaps they could introduce that metal railing at the sidewalk high level of the stair to refer it back and then have the glass follow as the stair goes, you know, down into the concourse. Okay. All right. So you um, are, would still like to see some changes before you could support it. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. Wellington, Chen, Commissioner Chen, can I move to you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I will repeat some of the comments. I think the observation that the other commissioners are correct. I think, um, you know, ever since 1931, they've been a steady, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, adjustments, they've been series of adjustments and changes. And I do agree with some of the comments about the original design intent of the Sunken Plaza level about the punch openings. I think the um, I think we have uh, deviated from that, uh, mm. moving further away from that direction, even though we can understand the need for connection, for transparency, uh, for making the improvement and bringing light and air into the, uh, the lower plaza. Um, I have less concern with the, um, the, the, uh, the new improvements to the, uh, to the north and south gardens. I think the delineation is now much stronger. Uh, uh, and, um, in the definition of, a, of, of the edges. Uh, obviously, can it be improved? Yes. Um, and so uh, I, I, I echo some of the uh, sentiments of the, uh, the previous comments. Okay, so generally supportive, is, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. And um, Commissioner Devonshire? I can support this as presented. I, I think that the uh, the original design at the sunken plaza, the fenestration and doors, I, I thought were very fortress-like. And, and now it's much more open, which is a problem. I think this is a perfect compromise for that. So I can support it. Okay, great, thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, whoops. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I was very supportive of the direction that the, pro the pro of the project uh, in the last presentation. And um, I feel very comfortable with the changes that have been made now. I think they've been really positive uh, improvements. I think the, in uh, the terrace area uh, where in the garden where the geometry has been reinforced and the landscape's been pulled in a little bit to actually um, 
better reflect the sense of geometry within the greater uh, plaza and project. I think that's been really uh, helpful. You know, I think we're uh, at the, at the uh, uh, sunken level, we are so far away, or it's been, this project has been so far away from the first iterations of, for better or worse, of what Rockefeller Plaza was at that time, that it's impossible to get back there. And so I appreciate many of the concerns that have been stated here. Um, but I feel like these changes have gone a long way to not only um, reinforce the geometry at the base, but also to do something very important, which is to open up the sunken plaza for circulation. Um, <clears throat> I think it was really very closed before. Um, there's this sense now with the uh, glass panels of verticality uh, that reflects uh, the buildings and also the flagpoles above it. Um, I think it's sort of visually quite wonderful and it ties it all together. I think the, you know, the increased width in the piers um, and uh, also creating uh, uniformity in their height um, has gone a long way. Um, I have to say, I really appreciate the increased glazing on the elevator in the landscaped area. It makes it recede even more. Um, and, um, and that's it. I think it's a very success. I think overall the project's very successful and I, I do wanna reinforce um, what was said in the presentation by the applicant, which is that this is a very important, dynamic, active um, landmark in this city and in Midtown, and it's an important connector between um, the commercial zone on Fifth Avenue and the office zone on Sixth. And I see it as uh, not only an important historic place, but it's an important place of tourism and commerce. And it's a real, um, it's a real mixing chamber. And I think that um, the changes that have been made are very respectful and they're also, um, they give voice to uh, how we, New York, and all of the people who live and work and visit it, you know, move through um, this area and need to move through. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to move to Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, when I reviewed the changes last Saturday, uh, this is um, I, I came up with this, um, this is a sensitive restoration, sensitive to the formal qualities of Rockefeller Center composition. In geometry is crisply defined by borders, edges, seating, and plant material. It reframes this masterpiece. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Gustafson. Well, I, uh, as a preliminary matter, I, I, I support the proposal as is, and, and largely because it's a, it's a dramatic improvement on, on for example, um, the, uh, the lovely 1980s elevators that used to be there, uh, which I don't think anybody's going to miss. Um, I think the uh, revised proposal is a, is a very big improvement um, on, the, um, on the original uh, proposal as well. Um, that said, um, you know, over the past uh, few days, I've had a chance to to look at some 1950s and 60s photographs of this of the plaza, and and I was trying to figure out why it is that um, <clears throat> what I sort of what my hesitance was about, um, and and I do support it, 
Um, and it, it just seems to me that, um, and maybe I'm just saying that there's a, there's, there's a line we're approaching at this point. Um, we're, we're nibbling away um, at the character of, um, of the plaza as we make these changes. Um, geometry and water features um, and the function of um, Rockefeller Plaza um, are, are all important. And what I mean by that, um, when you look at the roadbed, and I'm not objecting to the road, the change in the roadbed, um, it, the roadbed was originally designed um, for um, for the drama of um, your entry um, from your your cab, your car, your limousine, whatever it was, into um, Thirty Rock, um, and that's been eliminated. Um, and as I said, I don't object to that. But it was a um, the road as it is, as it was designed was a functional aspect of of the of Rockefeller Plaza. Um, the, the whole um, dynamic of it was a, um, a comprehensive balance between um, beauty and function and, um, and the audience experience of the sunken plaza. And what we're doing here is, you know, as you take down the, the taller fountains on either um, left or, with the, or we don't have the taller fountains on either uh, the uh, north or south side, for example, um, we, are, um, we, we seem to be um, moving more towards a 100% view that the audience experience of the sunken plaza is the, um, is the, is the uh, prime mover here. Um, and so um, while I am supportive of it as is, um, I think we're at a caution moment here where we're sort of um, uh, leaning too far in, in, in one direction. Um, that direction being, um, it's met by this, but I'm not sure that we want to keep going with it, which is to say, we're taking away dramatic elements in, that, that served a different purpose, beauty and function, as opposed to merely um, giving um, the tourist view um, of the, um, the street side view of the sunken plaza. So, uh, so I am supportive, but I am, um, I am, very, I am somewhat reluctant um, that we go further on this. Okay, thank you. And I think that, um, you know, again, I appreciate that. And I think we do have to be very careful with each and every application because cumulatively, cumulatively over time, there is an, an impact that um, we need to be cognizant of. Um, again, you know, as uh, Commissioner Devonshire said, I think that there's um, actually some positives to the changes to the sunken plaza, given the fact that, um, you know, decades even before designation, those walls had been opened up. So on the north and south walls, we're actually getting more solidity back. So I think in this case, uh, you know, I'm very comfortable because I think it is sort of a compromise where it restores some solidity where it's been removed while um, taking away some on other, other openings. So it's kind of a, uh, maybe an, even a little net gain in some of the proportion and, um, regular rhythm. Okay, but I think um, your point is well taken and I think we do have to be careful with the center. We see the many applications here. Um, it is a dynamic place, really important place to the city um, and you know, a, an art deco monument as well. And so each of those changes is, is very important to, uh, it's very important to carefully evaluate it. Um, but with that, I think we have um, six votes. I know Commissioner Holford Smith would like them to continue to look at the railings uh, um, at the sidewalk and the proportions of the piers to openings. But, um, but I think we ha can approve it as is today. We can ask them to you know, encourage them to continue to think about those aspects. But I think, we, I think we can go ahead and make a motion today to approve it as is. Um, so, um, Commissioner Devonshire, can I ask you if you don't oppose to make the motion for this item? With that, Commissioner Devonshire? Um, I just said so moved. Oh, can, well, unfortunately, we have to read the, the motion. <laughs> oh, happy to read it. Thank you. And I actually can bring it up on my screen now. Right. Yeah, it's the public um, meeting. Um, yeah, so just so it's in the public meeting package and just for the public, um, if this wasn't uh, obvious to begin with, this is a public meeting item. This was not a public hearing item. We held the public hearing um, previously and the applicant was coming back today to the 
to a public meeting to present changes in response to the commissioner's comments, which were made after listening to the pres original presentation and public testimony. So we, we do accept written comments, but there is no public testimony for uh, public meeting items. So um, the hearing is closed already and we're gonna go ahead and read the motion. All set? Yes, all set, thank you. 20 610 625th Avenue, the Rockefeller Plaza, Rockefeller Center, Channel Gardens, Sunken Plaza, and Rockefeller Plaza, an individual landmark. This is an application to alter the fountain, stairs, monuments, concourse level storefronts, and hardscape features. I recommend approval, finding that certain aspects of the work are restorative in nature, including the modification of the stairs leading down to the Sunken Plaza, by the removal of the solid parapet wall, the reestablishment of planters flanking the top of the stairs, and reinstallation of the statues Maiden and Youth in their original locations at the West Wall. But the work at the Sunken Plaza and Eastern Stairs in general will further enhance the traditional purpose and pattern of the use of these public spaces, which were intended historically to promote pedestrian and commuter access to adjoining concourse level shops, restaurants, and passageways. That the historic mason reopenings and commercial infill at the north, south, and west walls of the sunken plaza have been changed over time, including raising and combining openings, and the proposed work at these walls and the east walls in keeping with that tradition of change, while reestablishing unity at all four sides. That the new granite cladding and new operable glass and bronze infill at the perimeter walls of the sunken plaza match the historic infill in terms of materials and recall the historic repetitive visual rhythm of the walls that the new granite pilasters at the rebuilt sunken plaza walls were recalled the corresponding historical features to be removed and maintain the historical hierarchical relationship within the adjacent openings in terms of height, as well as the historic sense of solidity to the walls. That the installation of an armature supporting vegetation at the new sunken plaza walls will be reversible in nature and will extend the greenery found traditionally at the center's public spaces and gardens that the seasonal installation of the wood stair extension and movable planters recalls the original footprint and configuration of the stair and the traditional planter installations at the plaza while keeping, while being removable for the historic seasonal installation of the skating rink. That the new planters at the edges of the modified east stairs and the new stair handrails are in keeping with the planter and handrail installations throughout the center in terms of materials and design. That the installation of terrazzo paving with metal strips at the sunken plaza will not eliminate significant historic fabric is based on an historic condition and will relate harmoniously in terms of color and pattern to the sandstone paving found at other outdoor public spaces throughout the center. Okay. That, uh, go ahead. We're not done yet. Yeah. Yep. Right. No, I had to I had to page down. I'm sorry that the replacement of the glass block at the channel garden pools with new glass block over continuous glazing with a mirror finish accommodates upgrades to modern technology and the provision of light to the public concourse below while matching the historic glass block lining in terms of material, unit size, and configuration. That removal of the existing non-historic glass elevator kiosk from the north and south planter beds facing the sunken plaza will eliminate features that disrupt the green space. That the new elevator kiosk with integral illuminated wayfinding will be harmonious with the surrounding features in terms of their simple rectilinear design and glass and bronze materials, while their clear walls, smaller footprints, and local locations at the ends of the planting beds will help them to be minimally intrusive and blend visually with the surrounding historic features of the landmark site. That the rebuilt north and south planter beds will accommodate the new elevators as well as new stairs enhancing access to the side between the sidewalk, sunken plaza and concourse level and will recall historic planters in terms of geometric configuration and design incorporating granite walls with water features both character defining features of the public spaces at the center. That raising the street bed at Rockefeller Plaza will eliminate a trip hazard and the new granite edging replacing the curb will maintain the visual record of the plaza as a street. That the proposed new stone paving at Rockefeller Plaza will be harmonious with the paving found traditionally at outdoor spaces throughout the center in terms of material, color, and pattern, 
and the work at the street will eliminate the non-historic bollards. That the relocation of the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Monument and guardrail from the top of the stairs at the Sunken Plaza will help to reestablish the historic circulation between the promenade and the Sunken Plaza and the reinstallation of this historic monument on access at the opposite end of the Channel Gardens will maintain this historic feature at the site in a corresponding prominent location at this public space. And that the new locations of the smaller plaques at the Channel Gardens are in keeping with the historic locations. And. Um, Sarah, we need a, um, a second. Sorry, sorry you yes, to... I'm trying to do that. Okay. Can Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a second? All right, second, second this motion. Thank you. And uh, Rich will now call the vote. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lefty. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Nay. Okay, with eight in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank so you that all. is approved. Thank you. That's approved as is. And, um, you know, you, we encourage you to continue to think about some of the details that Commissioner Holford Smith described as well. All okay. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to the public hearing items now. The first is item number one. LPC 20-02842, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 2105, lot 15, 295 Claremont Avenue in the Fort Greene Historic District, a second empire style row house built in 1867. The application is to construct a side yard addition. Okay, so for members of the public, if you wish to testify on 295 Claremont Avenue, now is the time that you should enter the meeting. And the meeting ID information and uh, phone numbers are on the screen. They were on the screen a second ago. And we will, <laughs> there we go. And we will also display this slide when we commence public testimony. Thank you. And the um, applicants have joined the meeting and um, you may begin. Reminder to please state your name for the record. Thank you. And if the applicant could just unmute themselves, please. Thank you. And, and just uh, quickly, commissioners, just for purposes of the of the record, um, commissioners Bland and Goldblum have joined the meeting. The applicant may begin the presentation. You should be unmuted now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. we can. Hear. Sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Thank you, chair, um, for uh, your ability to adapt in the situation and um, give us all a sense of, of normalcy here. Not sure who to thank for following Rockefeller Center, but we'll, uh, we'll take that for what it is. Um, I am Martin Finio, architect, uh, partner at Christoph Finio Architecture, and I am here to talk about 295 Claremont Avenue, uh, a small uh, addition to uh, a townhouse on that block. Figure out how to advance the slide. Sorry. If you click on the slide, you um, may use the mouse or recommend that you use arrow keys as an alternate. Yeah, nothing's showing up on the slide. I can oh, advance here. the slide for Got you. Got it. Um, here is the project, 295 Claremont Avenue. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll just breeze through this. I know that we're, we're, we're uh, beyond time. So this is the 
uh, Brooklyn Community Board 2 district, Fort Greene in, in the dark gray. Um, within Fort Greene, this is the landmark district and the location of 295 Claremont. And here you see the project in context looking north along Claremont Avenue. Uh, a little more in context from across the street. These are the tax maps, both from the 1940s and the 1980s. You see that the building has is, is largely remained intact. Um, and here is the building today. And, and the focus of our, our uh, application is for that kind of unusual space you see between our building and the one to the south, which I'll talk about further. That space is interesting, just if you look at the context of the way that the block developed, um, uh, you can see our, our building context on the east side of the block. Um, here is the west side of the block. We can go through really quickly about how the buildings um, evolved on both sides. The very first building that exists today on the block started on the west side in 1850. Um, it was followed by a few others in 1851. Uh, in 1860, another group still all on the west side. And by 1865, much of the western side of the block was developed as you see it today. Um, it wasn't until 1867 that 295 Claremont, our project, um, was built on the east side. Um, that was then infill happened on the center of the block in 1868. And it was uh, the west side then followed in 1870, 1876. And then it wasn't until 1879 that the building adjacent to our building a full 12 years later um, um, uh, was created on that site. So here you see both sides of the block today. And here again, you see the current condition of our building. And you can see that unusual space of about two, two feet, four inches, uh, a kind of side yard. Um, on our property on 295 uh, between our building and, and 297. And that's the space that we would, we are um, I'm hoping to occupy with a very small addition, as you can see here, a kind of infill. We've affectionately called it the sidecar. Um, here you see it in elevation, which is maybe slightly deceiving, but um, it'll be more clear in other iterations here. Um, really what we're proposing is to occupy that space in such a way, as you see here, um, that sets very, very far back from the face of the building. In fact, it's about 14 feet, seven inches. If we remove the adjacent building to show it more clearly, here you see it in context. And the idea is, I'm, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, is that there's a, a at the parlor level, there's just a kind of a step out of the building uh, to allow light through. At the um, middle level is an extension to a master bathroom. And then the rest of it basically serves as a light well to that bathroom with a skylight on top. And as you can see, I said it's, it's about 14 and a half feet from the front face of the building and another 14 feet, nine inches from the rear of the building. A very narrow, tall uh, extension, uh, also that has clearance underneath it uh, to be able to pass through that space. Here you see it in plan at the three levels. Again, I mentioned it's a kind of a, a light niche on the parlor level. Um, an extension of the bathroom here in the middle level, and that's just the uh, extension of that light well at the top level. Here again, in a side elevation, you see it's about eight foot 10 clear from the alleyway side. Um, and you can see the materials, basically all glass that you will see from the Claremont side. So we looked at what kind of impact it would have visually on the street. Uh, we, here are four views, one that looks at it from sort of a little bit north up the block, and you can see that it is, is not visible from that point. Um, then we look as if you were standing straight across from the building itself, and you just begin to see a bit of a sliver of the uh, um, addition there. If we move directly onto it, obviously this is where you see it most, um, but again, we've tried to make it as transparent as possible so you're still looking through as much of this uh, addition as possible. And then if you move slightly more south, again, it, it more or less disappears. So what we determined is there's about a 15 foot wide um, area of, of visual access to the, to the uh, addition on the west side of the street and about a five foot window of visibility on our side of the block. 
um, just some details of the piece itself. As I mentioned, it is uh, a silicon glazed, structurally silicon glazed uh, glass, insulated glass, uh, where no mullions are visible on the outside face of the, the structure, so that it's as sort of taut and seamless as possible. The idea was to maintain kind of material consistency throughout uh, as much as possible so that you're both looking through it and not kind of looking at its um, articulation. Uh, some of those details, you can see the, the mullions that they, they set back from the face of the uh, glass. That's the, the bottom detail here. Um, if we look at the detail here, you see that that spandrel glass um, covers the floor level and that would be uh, back painted, but at the, in the same plane as the rest of the glass with the uh, minimal sort of mullion as possible. Um, up above again, continued continuity of the glass surface in front of the spandrel and at the top, it's the same. Um, the way that we've uh, achieved building department approval on this, because it's, it's, it's kind of an odd and, and uh, kind of snaking argument, but basically the space that we have is, is, is we call it a rear yard, but it most closely identifies with an open court once we begin to occupy it. So it's, it's a non-compliant condition and obviously we can't do anything that makes that condition any more non-compliant. So uh, we, we kind of skirted around that issue with the help of Scott Pavan, uh, DOB Commissioner, by, by looking, defining the space as open court uh, and by covering that area with this, um, what we're calling a or what will be a kind of a open grate uh, of, of uh, quarter inch square um, uh, steel bars that just can't leave off of our building and cover the entire length of that opening. Um, we take it out of the definition of open court, which allows the addition to happen. Uh, basically, we had two, op two options. One, we could occupy the entire depth of the, um, the areaway which would have put us in compliance, but we didn't, we didn't want to do that. We couldn't afford to do that. Or by occupying just a small degree of it, as long as we cover uh, the rest of the area with this sort of open grading, we are compliant. Um, these are some uh, uh, 3D printed models of the same piece that show you a little bit more the character. This is kind of beat up idea of the uh, uh, covering at this point. Um, but you get a sense of the um, degree and the, the kind of impact of the addition and how far set back it is. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions at this time? Please. Okay, I see Commissioner Shimmer Baron has a question, so I'd like to recognize you. Thank you. Uh, so this this uh, great does it have to be on the roof level, on the top level? Can it be lowered? Can it be contiguous with the top of your element? That that was that was my first question as well, and uh, in fact, it does have to be at the topmost level, because then then uh, otherwise the space above that is considered open court. All right, other questions? Okay, not seeing any hands. Oh, I see Commissioner Jefferson has a question. Please go ahead, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, one, one question. Uh, the form that you're putting in, why does it angle at the bottom? Why is it not just a rectangle? Uh, we wanted to, again, for us, continuity was important and the, the space uh, where the addition makes sense on the upper levels does not make sense on the parlor level because of the, an existing fireplace that's there. So we needed to kind of skirt back where we pop out on the parlor level. And instead of just stepping that up vertically and then stepping out, uh, we felt it was actually more um, uh, or less, less conspicuous to make this thing just a kind of um, continuous surface. Okay. Commissioner, okay. okay, Commissioner Bland. Thank um, you. Um, I'm wondering if um, we know the purpose of this space. It's an unusual, I think it's an unusual situation for a house of this uh, era. I'm aware of, I think they called them horse blocks or something like that, of 
earlier buildings, actually a place you could put your horse in your backyard. Um, does this have a purpose or is it just an unusual situation that occurred? It seems like an unusual situation because it would have to be a very, very skinny horse to get through there. It certainly uh, would. I, I agree with that. Um, so it's only two feet, four inches wide. Right. Uh, and like I said, it seems like our building, for whatever reason, just was not built to its property line. And the other building, the adjacent building was. So I, I don't know the reason for it. It's because it's really not even wide enough to sort of, you know, comfortably walk through as a, as a human being, let alone a horse. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thank you, Chair. Um, is there a minimum dimension that your um, bump out would, would have to be in order to not uh, trigger an, this top piece? In other words, if you kind of pushed it out five inches, would mm -hmm. you still need to um, put on the, the trellis on top? It, it seems like it's all or nothing. Either we build out to the very front of the building and the entire, the entire volume of that space, or any setback from there uh, requires the the One more question. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, if, if this were, say, a fireplace push out, would it would it require the same hmm. the, again the same cover? Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, not seeing any hands raised. I think we will now move to public testimony and we can um, continue questions after the testimony. So Lisa, do we have um, members of the public who are waiting to speak? Um, well, we did not have anybody sign up to speak for this item. Um, I see one person in the waiting room um, that I will admit. Roger Friedman. Roger, um, can you hear me? Lisa, I think Roger Friedman might be signed up for another item or, or intending to speak on another item. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, I don't think there's anybody other um, members of the public here to speak. Thank you. And Rich, uh, did we receive any written testimony? A no written testimony except for uh, Brooklyn Community Board 2 resolution recommending approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we have uh, Community Board 2 recommends approval. Um, Mr. Finio, is there anything else you'd like to add before we conclude and move into our discussion? Um, only that I, I feel like it was a, we, we came upon an unusual condition and wanted to figure out a way to occupy it in an unusual way that was modest in its intention and didn't seem to um, affect at all the existing context of the space. We, we feel we've done that and we hope that you do too. Okay, great. Commissioners, any final questions? Okay, so I think we'll move to um, closing the public hearing so that we can um, begin the public meeting and our discussion. So Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that? Second. Okay. And um, all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed. So we'll begin our discussion. Um, so, you know, this is a, a unique space as has been described. It sort of, I think, just seems to be that it was an earlier building and didn't occupy its lot the way the later rows did. Um, and this is a very setback uh, addition that has minimal view corridors, um, but is, you know, an interesting uh, contemporary take when it, you know, when you will see it from that uh, limited corridor. So why don't we go around the room and start the discussion? So I'll start with Commissioner Devonshire. I think this is fine. It's, it's really nearly invisible. Um, and it satisfies the client clearly. And again, they had the opportunity, but I guess not the money to mm. do a full depth addition and chose not to. So uh, I, I think it's quite modest. Okay, great. Commissioner Chen. 
I agree. It's a very marvelous uh, petition, and it's a uh, very unusual circumstances. So. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Bland. Agreed. Um, I think uh, it's terrific. I love the contemporary quality of it. I think it'll be an exciting little little tiny sliver that adds to this amazingly uh, consistent historic um, row. Uh, so this this little contemporary sliver set back as it is and so minor uh, will challenge not at all the very uh, beautiful uh, facade of this um, uh, handsome house. So I think it's wonderful. All right, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I think it's fine. It's modest, it's smart, it's, uh, it's fairly visible and it's almost like a little nice surprise as you're uh, passing it. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I support it. I think it'd be a wonderful addition. Imagine walking down the block and turning to my right and seeing this little space with something in it. It's very nice. Okay, great. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I think it's a very um, creative um, solution, um, you know, as opposed to uh, the other option with filling in the entire space because uh, we've seen a few of these over the course of time and, uh, and no one has ever suggested uh, creating something that's actually driven by the functional need in, in the building. Um, everyone suggests just filling the whole thing and taking full advantage. I think this is a terrific idea. Um, I am curious about uh, whether they could uh, work with staff on figuring out whether there's a less visible uh, uh, material or structure they could use for that, uh, the metal slat structure that goes over the top. I understand it's got to go full uh, length from front to back. But um, I don't know what the requirement is in terms of materiality. And if they could make that disappear, um, that, it'll, at least a little bit more, that'd be great. Okay, great. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree that this is um, a, a really beautiful <laughs> addition and it's both minimal and very kind of maximal in that it's so poetic and, and sweet, you know, as an expression of bringing light into, um, what an, an area that never gets light on these row house townhouses. Um, but I am really, I think that the open metal slat element is just um, undermines it. And I'm wondering really what can happen, even if, um, I, I, I don't know how to, how to deal with it. I'm wondering if there's any chance they can go back and, and really, if in fact they can find out if the depth of the, of the, of the, of the pop out um, might mitigate in other words, reducing that depth might mitigate the need for, for this trellis or for this slatting, because I think it just it just really does undermine it um, as a design feature. But also, you know, will you when you're looking at it, when you're experiencing it across the street, you'll wonder why why it's there. It just makes no sense. Um, so, I hope that they can fix that. But I support it otherwise. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I agree. This is a really ingenious solution, um, and I think it will be, will be such a little wonderful surprise to see this little glass sliver. Um, and I would agree that the, that the slats, that was my only question that I had about it was why they were there, and I understand it, but it would be nice if they were could be made less visible, but otherwise okay. I think it's fantastic. All right, Commissioner Chapin. <laughs> Uh, yes, I agree with the comments of other commissioners and I can support this. Okay. And Commissioner Goldblum? I agree. I can support it. Okay, great. So um, I think we have enough votes to approve it as is, but we can certainly encourage them to continue to work with DOB to see what changes they could make to minimize the visibility or reduce the amount of uh, slats at the top. Um, so. Uh, I think that um, we um, otherwise have the motions to approve as is. And so I'd like to ask Commissioner Lutfi to make that motion. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. In the matter of docket 20-02842-295 Claremont Avenue, Fort Green Historic District. A second empire style row house built in 1867. The application is to construct a side yard addition. I note that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic fabric of the Fort Greene Historic District. 
I recommend approval finding that the work will not damage any significant architectural features, that the proposed uh, two foot, four inch wide side yard addition will only be visible from a limited vantage point on Claremont Avenue through a gap in the street wall behind an existing metal gate that the modest size of the proposed side yard addition will maintain a sense of the building's original massing and will not overwhelm the building or site, that the addition will be set back deeply from the front and rear facades and its simple design and materials will help it remain subordinate to the historic building and streetscape, that the open metal slat structure over the remaining portion of the gap between this building and its neighbor will recall pergolas and other rooftop elements sometimes found on row houses and will feature a gray finish, helping it remain a discrete presence, and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Fort Greene Historic District. Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Yes, I will. I second it. Okay. And Rich, will you now call the roll for the vote? Yes. One moment. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner mm -hmm. Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, rather in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that's approved. So we are gonna take a three minute break right now. And um, commissioners, if you need to step away, just turn your uh, video and uh, volume off and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you.
But I thought you, the two volume thing, you know, one bigger and one smaller. All right, I think we have three commissioners missing, um, but we do have a quorum if we want to start to read the next one in. Okay, yes, I'll uh, start back up with public hearing item number two. This is LPC 20-07252, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 2112, lot 54. 136 Fort Green Place in the Brooklyn Academy of Music Historic District, an Italianate style row house designed by Effingham H. Nichols and built in 1859. The application is to replace windows. Okay, thank you. And for members of the public, if you wish to testify on 136 Fort Green Place, now um, is the time to enter the meeting. The meeting ID information is on the YouTube screen as well as the phone number if you'd like to dial in. And we will display the meeting numbers again as the public testimony portion of the hearing commences. Okay, Edith, we may turn it over to the applicants now. Uh, the applicant has entered the meeting and uh, has been given uh, access to the presentation. And uh, you may begin, although I, I do not know if you have audio at this time. Can you please begin and state your name for the record? Thank you. Is the applicant on mute, perhaps? Um, Mr. Steinen appears to have now joined audio. There we go. I'm sorry. I've got that now. Okay, perhaps. great. No, I just, I just it, yeah, there was a couple of Mr. controls Steinen I had to go through. So. so you have now joined audio? Yes. There we go. I'm sorry. I've got that now. Okay, okay. great. Perhaps. No, I just, I can, just can you please turn the, the audio on the YouTube down, Mr. Stein? Just did. Okay. Yeah, there was a, quite a few windows open here. So I'm, I think I've got it all settled. So. Um, okay, I'm ready to go. And then if you can just click on the screen, you will have access to the presentation. Okay, let me see if I've got that going. Enlarge this. Okay, I think, there we go. Okay, so uh, again, my name is Christopher Steenon. Um, I live at 136 Fort Green Place. I'm the owner and I'm also the architect uh, for this. Um, the house is located in the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music Historic District. Uh, we're sort of at the far corner over here uh, near the Atlantic Terminal. So just at the very edge of this thing uh, where we're at. Um, the proposal here is to just to change out the windows. And uh, just a quick history on this. I had submitted to do this way back in 2005, had never been able to do it. Um, we had proposed originally to do one over ones. Uh, when I resubmitted this time, um, you were requesting that I uh, replace them with two over twos. And I pushed back initially on this because the, uh, I, I didn't see um, a precedent for that, although quite a few houses now have two over twos uh, along the street. So looking at that, we agreed that two over twos would be okay but I'm proposing that I want to raise the check rail on the parlor level windows to align with the shutters. Um, and I'll show you the precedent for that in just a moment. And uh, likewise on the rear windows, I would like to uh, install one over ones on the back uh, since there's all manner of windows uh, on the interior of the block, even though it's visible uh, from Hanson Place, the side street. So that's generally why we're here before you today. Um, this picture is showing you the, uh, the 1940s photo and the existing photo. Um, I'll be quite honest, the windows on the upper two floors are the same uh, from 1940. They are quite old. Uh, some of the glass is still floated glass um, and some of the glass is actually sagged in the windows. They've been there for quite some time. Um, they're still operable, but they really are not uh, very energy efficient at all. They leak like crazy. There's no sound attenuation and so forth. So at this point, we're ready to to change them out. 
The parlor windows were replaced, I would guess, in the 1990s with a very inexpensive replacement window, which is now uh, really uh, doesn't work anymore. Um, and then the basement windows, uh, I believe, are still the originals from the photos there. And those are very old. I don't think those have been changed uh, for a long time. So the proposal, whoops, let's see if I can go to the next. There we go. So um, the proposed changes I were doing, here's the existing is on the left. You can see there are one over one windows. Um, almost all the windows on the block were changed to one over ones back in the 1940s. And I'll show you those images in a moment. Um, we looked at the two over two on the front and actually it's, it's, it's rather nice. Um, it, it accentuates the vertical uh, element of the house in a way that uh, I think makes it nicer. Um, uh, and so we're ready to do that. But again, I wanted to elevate the, uh, the check rail just up a little bit so that it aligned with those older shutters. On the rear of the house, um, it's, um, it's all one over ones right now. And uh, we're proposing the same. Although the, the parlor level left windows on there, I wanted to raise a check rail there also, but those are not visible from anybody. So uh, I, we didn't have any pushback uh, from your uh, uh, staff there when we proposed that. So that's okay. So it really is the upper windows we're proposing to have one over ones. And here's the windows in the back, just the existing conditions. The, the parlor levels are on the on the, uh, the left side here. They do have the wood, wood frames. The, uh, the metal uh, replacement windows that are there are all fogged over. They are no longer uh, useful. So we're gonna replace those. On the upper floor, uh, also all aluminum windows. Um, with uh, aluminum panning around it. The wood is in very, very bad uh, condition. Most of it's rotted away, at least where it's been exposed, certainly on some of these windows. And so all of this has to be replaced. And again, we're looking for one over one windows in the, on, the, on the back. And uh, it is visible from Hanson Place. There's a missing building on the corner of Hanson Place and uh, um, St. Felix Street. I know that's been before you before. Don't know the status of that or how long it will be before that ever gets built. Uh, but in the meantime, we are exposed a little bit. So you can see the upper uh, parts of the house there and those windows. You can also see that all the windows on, uh, along this back end are all one over ones. Um, and on the opposite side of the block, the ones that we see on the backyard, there's all manner of windows, different versions. There's greenhouse types, there's large glass panes, there's, it's, it's, it's a whole, uh, variety of things that we see back there. So I was less concerned about those. Um, the front windows, uh, as I mentioned, they are quite old. Um, and uh, they, uh, what we've been replacing them with is a Marvin style window. We are trying to hold, at least I am trying to hold the proportions as much as possible to match what's there now. Um, currently there's a two inch brick molding around the, the edge with a slight reveal about a quarter inch and we're, you know, would like to keep that as much as possible. Inside, of course, the windows are slightly different, but for the most part, I think the look will be the same. They're proposed to be wood windows, wood outside painted black. So again, our, our, my goal is to, to match as closely as possible what's there now. Here is the sill. Uh, look on this and you can see it again more closely. Again, a two inch uh, brick molding along all, all the sides that we're proposing as well. And then of course the, uh, the windows and we've shown the, um, the center mullion for the front windows, uh, which would be a seven eighths inch um, line there uh, just to divide it into the two over two paints. Um, this is from my earlier proposal back in 2005 when I was justifying raising the check rail on the parlor windows on the front. And I showed how um, when you have a, what, what, what's going on here is that there's a five panel shutter system on the, on the windows. And these are old. I, I believe that they are original to the house. And um, the only windows that I found on the block that appeared to be from a much earlier uh, era were at 120 Fort Green Place. Uh, they had a four over six window, which aligned for the most part with the shutters because you can see that there's sort of a five paneled window system to match the five panel shutter system. So check rail was split, you know, two fifths, three fifths. And that's what I was proposing uh, at that time. Um, this is the page from my proposal from back in 2000 and when we originally had done this. Um, 
I'll mention that the restoration of this house has been taking a long time and there's been all sorts of interruptions starting with the uh, 2008 crisis and uh, of course uh, it might be some time before we get the windows fixed on this one again but nonetheless here's what was proposed um, from the one over ones to a one over one um, and that was approved uh, with a different window system but, uh, but not this time. But I still think the check rail is important and I just wanna go through the details of why. Um, this is showing the details on the window frame uh, on the basement window, uh, which is consistent with what's happening on the windows above in terms of the, the brick molding. It's a two inch brick molding with a quarter inch reveal on the side. So again, we're trying to copy that. On the basement window shown on the right, the center mullion is about two inches um, you know, of wood plus the, uh, plus the glazing compound, which makes it a little bit thicker, but that's what's happening on the bottom window. Um, I use this a little bit as a precedent in order to demonstrate that the window check rail, even on the basement window is not exactly in the center either. It's actually raised slightly so that the glass proportions are of the same height and on the right side here, I'm showing how the shutter systems on the inside are actually of different heights too. So it's not two equal size shutters. The shutters are 27 inches, 25 and a half inches. And in my opinion, no builder is gonna go through the effort to make different size shutters without a reason. And the reason is they're trying to align it with the check rail on the windows. So the windows and the shutters match. And so that's that's the reason why I'm proposing the check rail be raised on the parlor floor. And here are the shutters from the parlor floor looking from the inside. And I've sort of shown the dimensions. Again, every shutter is a different dimension. So it's not as if they're off the shelf things that someone just sort of slapped into place. Plus they're quite old. I've sort of shown where there are, you know, just close ups of here showing the uh, the old rectangular nails that make up the molding. In fact, all the molding uh, in this room where I'm presenting right now is, uh, is, is old, it's very old. We've stripped it uh, and this is the condition now. But as you can see, the check rail on the window just doesn't align with anything. It was sort of a thoughtlessly installed replacement window when they put the one over ones in. So uh, what I'd like to do now obviously is put in, well, two over two, but with the check rail raised. And then finally, I just wanted to show this precedent uh, this is the 1940 photos from many of the windows on the block. Uh, by the time 1940 rolled around, almost all the block had changed the windows to one over ones. Um, and I know through the discussions we've had, that's probably not consistent with what was originally there in 1860 when the houses were first built. But what is interesting is that in these photos, many of these houses still had the five panel shutter systems. At least the lower shutters are closed, which is common because the windows go all the way to the floor, um, but they are of one fifth height, which suggested that they would have had similar shutters to what is in my house. Now there is an interesting exception at 124 Green Place. That's the window that I showed you earlier that had a four over six window panel, you know, and from the proposal I gave in 2005. Here it is in 1940 and it's four over six instead of, I'm sorry, it was four over six from the 2005 photo it's six over nine, but so, here it is as a four over six, which I'm gonna guess was probably closer to what the original windows might've been along the block because A, it aligns with the shutters and, uh, and, and, and it's a different style there. So, so that was the reason there, but nonetheless, the proposal again was to uh, go back to one over two. So I'm just gonna back up here quickly to get to the uh, front facade photo, which was the proposed window. Here we go. Anyway, I'm skipping around a bit, oh, there we go. So. That's the proposal and that's, uh, that's where we stand. So again, just getting an approval to do two over twos on the front with a raised check rail as shown in the image and then approval to do one over ones in the back. All right, so commissioners, just to, to clarify, I think the applicant made it clear, but um, when he referred to the staff pushing back or, or saying, uh, rejecting something, that what that meant was that the staff couldn't approve a certain configuration at staff level pursuant to the rules and, and therefore it's coming to you. So now the two over two windows on the upper floors are eligible for a staff level review because they're in keeping with the age and style of the building. Um, and the parlor floor windows, the reason those are before you is because typically in buildings built in the 1850s and this is 1859, um, the multi-light window, building had multi-light windows. And if they had an asymmetrical 
sash at the parlor floor, the number of panes sort of corresponded to the asymmetrical proportions. So you had, as the applicant uh, presented uh, with the neighboring building, a four over six. Sometimes you had a two over six, depending on the size of the opening. And oftentimes in the 1850s, those windows did have that wide vertical uh, center muntin with a bead in it, which is actually evident at the basement level of this building to recall a, a casement window, even though it was actually a double hung, um, an asymmetrical double hung. So the, um, the configuration in, at the, so the, the raised meeting rail with a different configuration might have been eligible for a staff level approval, but with the straight two over two and the raised meeting rail, that um, is before you because it doesn't exactly match a historic prototype. And then with respect to the windows on the front facade, if those windows were not visible, the windows that are being proposed would be a staff level approval, but they're before you because they are visible um, from the back at the upper floors. So hopefully that helps to explain why we're looking at the windows we're looking at today. Are there any questions? Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Please go ahead. Was there any discussion about, um, uh, clearly the, those basement windows are original. Was there any discussion about having the wider mountain with the, with the B to replicate casement on the windows above? Um, am I on mute? I, I'm unmuted here, so I'll, I can answer that. Yes, the, uh, we had talked about that, uh, having a wider center uh, Munton on the parlor floor windows. And I'm open to that. Um, uh, we, we hadn't drawn it that way. We'd shown the seven eighths inch wide initially. That is uh, what some of the other houses have actually done. Uh, however, uh, I'm willing to accept that the precedent, uh, certainly from 120 Fort Green Place from that 1940s photo, which showed a wider center rail there is, um, is okay. I, hadn't settled on exactly what the width would be per se. Uh, I know that when you get to the two inches, it's looking quite thicker, maybe like one and a seven eighths or one and an eighth or one and a half or something like that would be, you know, so there's a transition going on there, but um, I'm, I'm open to that. The, 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 visually, I think if, if, that, if that vertical mountain is wider, then it lessens the visual impact of the change in the, in the uh, check rail uh, location. Yeah. Anyway, just curious. And Thank it you. is a big, it's a big window. So, you know, there, there is a justification there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Anyone else? Okay. So not seeing any hands raised. I'm going to turn to Lisa to see if we have anyone here to speak from the public. Yes. Um, nobody signed up to speak on this item and I do not see anybody in the waiting room um, to speak. Okay, thank you. And um, Rich, can you let us know if there's a community board resolution? Or yes, anyone else? Yeah. yes uh, we do have a community board resolution from Brooklyn CB2 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, any final questions for the applicant? Um, okay, Mr. Steenan, we are um, going to move into our discussion. Are there any final comments you'd like to make before we do that? Um, no, just thanking you for your time and uh, allowing us to set up the review this way. So um, one, one thought was, uh, was mentioned, uh, the duration of an approval is, is, is seven years, correct? I was trying to get... Um... A, a permit that it is derived from a commission approval has a uh, lifespan of six years. It expires okay. after six years. Um, I have to say, uh, about four or five months ago, I was all set to change these windows. And right now we're looking at it sort of with uncertainty. And I'm wondering if there's a way to make that a longer time frame so we don't have to go through this again in six years, just in case. So. Yeah, so yeah, every, every applicant has a sort of as of right option to renew their permit okay, for fine. an additional three years. Um, but there are certain conditions um, that we have for that renewal. So you can work with your staff person and they can talk to you about how to do that at the right and what the okay. right time. To do All right, that. thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I think there are no other questions. Uh, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Uh, second. 
Okay, and in a second, we will call that vote. Okay, everyone is now unmuted. So all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. Any, any opposed? Aye. Okay. And um, so we are now, we've closed our hearing. We're in the public meeting portion of our proceedings. And um, Commissioner Chen, I'm gonna just mute you because I hear some background noise, but I will unmute you when we get to the discussion. Um, so this is um, an application for the parlor floor window configuration and for the window configuration of the upper two floors of the rear facade. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you, since you had a question um, and have had time to think about it, would you like to start the discussion? Well, actually, um, I think ideally what I would like to see is that large central mountain on all of the windows, which is what this would have been when it was first built. But there have been changes um, in, I, I guess in the, uh, in the full picture of it, I'm, I'm okay with it the way it's being proposed. Okay, okay. So with the seven eighths Munton at the parlor floor? Yep, that's fine. Okay. All right, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree with uh, Michael. I think that um, it's not perfectly uh, res historically accurate, but I think it's um, an improvement, and I think it's uh, close enough. And I, I appreciate the applicant's um, concern for coordinating the, the shutters with the, with the mullion, which I think will have a direct effect on how the how the House is perceived from the street and it's it's very sensitive and appropriate. Okay, great. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I think raising the check rail is very uh, appropriate given uh, the shutter situation and the uh, documentation which uh, the applicant presented. So I, I can approve it. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith. I agree. I think raising the check rail um, will be an improvement and I can support the application as is. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm in agreement. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, agreed. Commissioner Jefferson? I'm in agreement. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi? I'm in agreement. And Commissioner Bland? In agreement, and I would just add, that's not me. I would just add one thought uh, to the applicant who's made a very fine presentation here, that Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Commissioner Chen. Agreed. Okay. All right, so um, Rich, will you go ahead and make that motion, uh, do the roll, uh, sorry. I'm just, I, Commissioner Chen, I'm muting you. There seems to be some static or background noise, but we'll unmute you again for the vote. So I will ask um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make this motion if you're not opposed? I uh, yes, I will. Okay. Sorry. Um, in the matter of um, a certificate of appropriateness for a Brooklyn LPC 2007252, 136 Fort Green Place, Brooklyn Academy of Music Historic District. An Italian eighth style row house designed by Effingham H. Nichols and built in 1859. Application is to replace windows. I note that the building style, scale, uh, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the historic district. I further note that the historic two over two double hum windows with articulated vertical muttons remain at the basement level. I recommend approval, finding that the work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the proposed windows at the front and rear facades will match the historic windows in terms of operation, material, and finish, 
that the proposed two over two configuration at the upper floors of the uh, front facade will be in keeping with windows historically found at buildings of this style, uh, type and age. And that the proposed one over one configuration at the rear facade will harmonize with the one over one configurations at the rear facades of the adjacent buildings. Right, and, and just to note that the, the finding about the two over two configuration applies to all the windows on the front facade. Okay, yeah. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, Rich, will you call the vote? Yes. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you very much uh, and good luck, Mr. Steenan. Okay, and we'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 20-07474, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 605, lot 31 and 7501. 657 Greenwich Street, AKA 653 to 677 Greenwich Street, uh, and 132 to 144 Christopher Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. Federal style church building built in 1821 to 22. A federal style row house built in 1825 to 26 and a school building designed by Thomas M. Bell and built in 1955. The application is to alter a fence. Okay, and any members of the public who wish to uh, participate in the hearing and comment on this proposal, now is the time to enter the meeting. Uh, the meeting information is on the slide now and we will display this slide again as the public testimony portion of our hearing continues. And the applicants have joined the meeting. Um, please uh, state your name for the record to continue. Here. If you could please state your name for the record. Uh, are they on mute or do they have to join the audio? The applicant no? is not on mute, and you please state your name for the record, and you begin your no? presentation. Yes, you may begin the presentation. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please begin. Sit. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear Hello. you. Yes, we can hear you. So please state your name and you can begin your presentation. Hello? I don't think she can hear us. I think Hello? we can ask that the uh, perhaps the staff begin the presentation Hello? while we try to work with the applicant to uh, get connected. Thank you. Let's do that. Uh, James, would you be able to start the presentation? Uh, yes. Hi. Thank you. Okay. James, I will uh, just uh, give you access to the presentation momentarily. Okay. Edith, do I have control of the presentation? Okay. And 
Signe Nielsen, if you can hear me, you can join. Okay. The application before you is to uh, make permanent a 30 foot extension, sorry, 30 foot, a three foot wide, 40 foot uh, long extension to a chain link fence. Can everyone hear me? Yes, James, we can hear you. Yes, we thank can you. hear you. Keep going. Um, at the Christopher Street uh, side of the St. Luke's uh, Church in the Village and School Playground. You can see that here. The extension to the fence um, was permitted last year under a temporary permit. And the current application is to make this installation per, uh, permanent. Um, it's 40 feet wide, uh, three foot tall, and it uh, corresponds to a half basketball court behind it. The other aspect of this presentation is to um, legalize the vinyl ivy clad covering that spans the length of the Christopher Street chain link fence. Okay, so and James, you just described it as a vinyl ivy clad covering. Is it a print on vinyl or is it actually clad in ivy? It is a, a ivy print on vinyl. Okay. All right. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions? What happened? Any questions at this time? Okay, uh, I see a question from Commissioner Jefferson. Please go ahead. Yeah. Can, can you see through the vinyl or is it, uh, can you see through the vinyl at all? Sorry, Commissioner Jefferson, let me just uh, get to that slide. Uh, the, the purpose of the covering is so that you can't see into the playground from the street. It, it's solid. And, and, and why? Why not see the playground? Commissioner, so this this is uh, this is a fence that's fronting a playground with children of different ages. I think there's been an attempt to provide privacy uh, from people walking by for some time. You can see on the image on the top left, there was a more temporary dark green covering put up on portions of the fence. And we believe the applicant was trying to kind of continue that, increase its height uh, to some degree, but add a little more uh, interest to the covering itself, which is uh, how we ended up with the, the vinyl covering with ivy that you see today. And just to, just to clarify that that is installed, so it's, this is really a request to, to legalize that. Um, the other part of the application is to make permanent this sort of three foot extension that happens behind that one tree towards the middle, where there's a basketball hoop behind that to uh, sort of hold the, or provide a backdrop for the basketball goal and any balls that are being thrown up in that direction. Hello? So two parts. It's Signe, we can hear you. Can, can you? Uh... Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Oh, phew. Um, so what am I, should I be on Zoom? Okay. I'm on. Well, we we're in the presentation. Oh, I don't know what to do. Signe, so if yes. you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? We can, can, and can you hear me? This is Chair Carroll. Me? Yes, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? I, okay. I, I think, think she, audio. I'm sorry. something is wrong with her audio. Can you so, hear me? Can you hear me? What? Can somebody um, try to assist her with her audio? And in the meantime, James can continue to answer uh -huh. her question. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, hi. Okay, hi. So, so oh. Commissioner Shamir Barron has a question. So why don't we go ahead with that? Thank you. It appears as though there is an existing wall behind the fence. Is that the case? And if so, and if so, why is there a fence in front of the wall? And has there been an attempt to um, increase the height of that wall? I'm just confused about what I'm seeing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Barron. Um, Shamir Barron, uh, let me just Hello? show you. Can someone hear me? 
Hi, Signe, we, we can hear you, uh, but I think, Hello? Signe, okay. I think so something's wrong. Mute, we have to mute her so we can keep moving. I, I have been muting Signe, but she has keep, yeah. uh, she keeps on muting herself. I Is there someone who can call her to give her some assistance? Call her on her phone. Do we have her phone number? Yes, I, I, I'll provide that number to... Um, James, give me the phone number. I can, I can give her a call. Thank you. Uh, j just, I'm sorry. Okay, sent. Um, yeah, sorry, to, to, to explain just uh, back to the plan of this. So the chain link fence, uh, there is nothing behind the chain link fence. However, on Hudson Street, there is a, a brick fence. And there is a brick pier at the corner right here, if you can see in my arrow. Okay. All right, other questions? No. Okay. And okay, uh, Shamir, Commissioner Shamir Barron has another question. So we'll go ahead, followed by Commissioner Jefferson. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. Thank you. So why a chain link fence as opposed to a more substantial um, built structure that is wall-like or fence-like or something? Why chain link fence? Sure. Uh, sorry, Commissioner. Um, so the chain link fence is a grandfathered condition. And I'm just going to uh, go up. They, the applicant received a permit last year to extend uh, the nine foot fence, which is on a, a, a little concrete curb uh, for a 40 foot section behind the basketball, half basketball court that you see here. They extended it three feet um, with a temporary permit for a chain link fence uh, section uh, for the basketball. Uh, so the, the actual chain link fence, while it may not seem substantial, is a grandfathered condition. Okay. And we're reviewing just the uh, making permanent this little extension piece for the basketball court and the uh, vinyl covering. So they're not replacing the chain link. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Does, does the vinyl covering wrap around the corner also? It does not. The vinyl covering is only along Christopher Street. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, and I don't know, Rich, if we've had any made any progress reaching the applicant. Yes, we have reached the applicant. She is muted. She can't seem to, to hear us, but we can hear her. Uh, this seems to be an ongoing issue, so uh, she is right now muted, and um, she is still here in Zoom with us. Can she put on the YouTube video while we talk so that she can hear the testimony? Yeah, I, she seems to be nodding her head, so I'm going to unmute her to see if she can speak. Okay. So I have the you YouTube video on. Okay. Okay, great. Good. Okay, Lisa, can we uh, see if there's anyone who is signed up to speak on this application? Um, we did have um, Chanel Spence from uh, Community Board 2 sign up to speak, but I don't see um, them in the waiting room, and nor do I see anybody else on this item to speak. Okay, so Rich, do we have a, a copy of the Community Board 2 resolution? Yes, we do. They recommended denial of the application. Okay, all right. Um, so th this is uh, challenging, but if the applicant can hear me through YouTube, YouTube perhaps um, she could respond to some of the, uh, the respond to the uh, community board resolution and maybe explain what some of the discussion was at the community board. Is that possible, Signe? If if you can hear me on YouTube, can you speak and we can hear you? I can hear you. Okay, great. So can, this is the applicant. I can yeah. hear you. So would, would you be able to explain a little bit about the discussion at the community board and what some of the concerns were and what your response is? Uh, 
Um, yes, some of the concerns. So my challenge is Signe, if you can mute the YouTube while you are speaking, that would be helpful. I don't know how to mute the YouTube and still hear you. If you can hear us on Zoom. Well, I think she can't hear us can on hear Zoom. Me still. We can hear you. So perhaps okay, if you could but just. I can't hear you, so we will uh, proceed. Yeah. That's the problem. I can't. So if you maybe just um, either turn down the volume or just ignore YouTube while you're speaking, there's a little bit of a delay and it, it'll confuse you, I think. So just, just speak as if you were um, speaking to us. We can hear you perfectly well. And then um, you can hear us through <clears throat> YouTube. All right, I will begin, I'm afraid to say, speaking blind. Um, some of the concerns with the, um, that the community board raised had to do with uh, whether the um, whether the design on the fence panel was appropriate, um, we had picked ivy simply because it was uh, neutral, cheerful, uh, and far preferable to the um, black vinyl that is there today. Um, and there was some uh, suggestions for whether this vinyl print should be a replication. Uh, of, a, of a brick wall. We did not respond to that, but that was one of the um, uh, suggestions that had been made by the community board. Okay. All right, thank you. Commissioners, are there any other questions? Okay, so I think we'll um, move into the discussion period of our uh, hearing, which is, means to close the public hearing and commence the public meeting portion. So, um, Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, will you second that motion? Second. Great, thank you. So we are now um, in our public meeting portion of our hearing and we will begin our discussion. And this, um, you know, Unfortunately, it was a somewhat confusing presentation only because of the technical difficulties here, but um, I think James made it very clear that the staff approved a temporary installation which involved raising the height of the chain link fence around the basketball area and um, the applicants would like to keep that raised portion permanently. And then um, they would also like to legalize this vinyl that has been installed on the fence um, as well, which has a pattern, a print, an ivy print on it um, to, I, I guess, sort of evoke the garden nature of the space in between the buildings at this campus. So um, with that, I think it would be great if we could start a discussion and, um, Maybe we'll start this one with, um, why don't we start with Commissioner Bland? Oh dear. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I was not aware of this uh, situation and I'm, I'm finding myself to be kind of appalled by it. Um, not the design per se, although I'm not a fan of the Ivy necessarily, but the whole idea of visual privacy of playground. I mean, is this is this something that's occurring all over the city? I my office used to be very near uh, Grace Church's schoolyard, which is lovely and open, and it was wonderful at noontime to see all the kids out playing. I I just don't understand why we're doing this, and if if so, is this a precedent that then everybody's going to hide and protect the kids playing in playgrounds? I I can't imagine a city like this. I, 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 that's, that's my situation. I mean, yeah. do, do, do I like a brick wall applique more than an ivy? Maybe because it's, it seems more in fitting, but I mean, even this picture showing all the brick and the, but the whole idea of it is kind of appalling to me. I, I have to just admit that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think, you know, this is um, interesting because I think that many schools do try to 
um, create some security and privacy for the for children playing. So I think it's not unusual and not the first time we've seen uh, requests for privacy for sort of the areas that children will be. But certainly, yeah. you know, historically there were playgrounds open everywhere. So I think it's something, sort of one of those things that is in a historic condition, um, but is something that we do see a request I, for. Yeah, I meant to start my 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 thoughts by saying I think my thoughts were irrelevant because a lot of this seems to be um, a grandfathered situation. So yeah. I recognize that, but my heart is just leaping forward and saying this is a terrible precedent. Right, and I think um, you know in terms of the print, whether it's ivy or brick, um, or what they have now is just sort of a black. Mm -hmm. a vinyl or something that's behind it perhaps one finds that more neutral and is a barrier or some visual barrier that a neutral is better than a floral um, but let's go around and see what others think okay actually so, um commissioner commissioner bland do you have any opinion on the extension of the fence that three foot extension as well that's the two things in front of the commissioners right now right uh, i i would say don't do that um, just keep it straight across. I mean, it's, it's not a basketball that we're worried about seeing. It's the person, I guess, if anybody's worried about that. So I would not. The, the, the height of that, basketball. the height of that is because there's a basketball hoop behind it. So they're just sort of. Yeah, I don't think we mind that. seeing the basketball hoop. It's, that's not a security issue. It's seeing okay. a person maybe. So I think right. there's okay. two parts. There's the raising of the chain link in that one portion and then the vinyl. So I think um, you're comfortable with the raising of the chain link. Sure, sure. Because the basketball is gonna go over the fence and into the street otherwise. Okay, great. All right, Commissioner Lutfi. So yeah, I'm having a whole, having a problem with it as well. So, uh, you know, on, um, tennis courts, there are often privacy screens because the, the courts are so close together and you don't want to be distracted by the play around you. So there's often, if there are multiple courts um, back to back lined up, there are these very understated green, not completely, um, you know, partial, not completely dense in terms of the fabric. You can see through them a little, but you have the sense of privacy. And I feel like if it's important to have something, we should do something like that. That's very understated. And it certainly shouldn't go up to the top of this fence. I mean, okay. I, I would love to lower the fence if it's really important to have it raised. It's, uh, I can be in favor of it. Okay, great. And Commissioner Jefferson? Um, this is a tough one. I think the defense, the graphic is so dominant, it's so powerful. I would recommend maybe layering different uh, grids on the fence so at least you would have some transparency. If that's not possible, maybe there's a graphic pattern that's softer, uh, and not so dominant because this is okay. this is extreme dominance. It just um, it's just too powerful for me. All right, great, Commissioner Gustafson. All right, well, let's let's start with the fence. The fence is grandfathered, so the fence is what it is. I, I don't understand why one designs a basketball hoop to be on the outside rather than on the interior of the schoolyard, but that's not before us. That's just poor planning. Um, so the fence is the fence. Um, I am completely opposed to the graphics entirely. I don't care what the graphics are. There are hundreds of New York City public school playgrounds around this city um, that don't um, have um, uh, privacy screens of any sort whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and, and even if there was one suggested here that was um, halfway decently reasonable, uh, then I'd consider it. But uh, um, uh, th this, is, this, th this is just awful. Um, uh, you know, I, I would, they should just, they might grow English ivy on it and have the real thing, you know, um, but I'm just completely opposed to this. There's nothing appropriate about it in this neighborhood. 
Thank you. Commissioner Shemay Barron. So, um, you know, I, I don't actually object to the image as an image or to um, a, anything, a, a continuous image. What I object to is the fact that this is actually no longer a fence at all. And it's there, nothing about it is screen-like or fence-like. It's an, it's an opaque solid wall. And we, I mean, we, you know, make so many efforts in so many cases when fences are presented to us for, th for those fences, even in, in parks and places where there are his historic tall fences to make sure that they are lowered. So, um, so, so the point here is that we would be approving a solid wall that it would only be, uh, and, and the proposal here is for it to be made even taller. So I guess I, if the assumption is that the fence is the fence grandfathered, then fine. And then I think it needs to be much more fence-like or screen-like, which means it needs to be, has have transparency. So the material needs to either be completely much more film-like so that you can see a hazy picture through it um, or um, perforated in some way. Uh, so again, it's not the image the problem that it, I find problematic, but it's opacity. Commissioner Halford Smith. Um, I, I agree with the previous comments from the commissioners. Um, I, I find the opacity to be very disturbing as well as the height of it. Um, I don't object to the raised section of chain link behind the basketball uh, hoop, but I think if it was a more neutral, translucent uh, material and perhaps it not as tall as it even is uh, the, the IV image that, but perhaps it could be lower than that. Um, and there are also some accretions on top of it that, that I think are really also very disturbing. Um, mm -hmm. So if it'd be something more, trans, more transparent and not as high to at least to give some privacy, but not to block the you know, complete view of the okay, down behind. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah. I agree with extending the fence. Uh, I also agree that um, this uh, covering is not appropriate because it is creating a wall like uh, uh, condition. I could go along, I think, with some kind of a privacy screen, but it should be either maybe a translucent, I started thinking about, you know, like a a glass or some kind of a light a plastic or something that you could see through because, or, you know, a, a screen uh, element, which is, uh, uh, you know, metal or wood or something that, that permits light through, but not clear views of the interior. Some ways I like the idea of a translucent one, just because you could see sort of get a sense of the activity without actually seeing uh, individual uh, children. So anyway, uh, the, uh, in addition to the concerns about um, the, you know, blocking your view uh, entirely and, and creating a wall-like effect, I'm concerned about this vinyl material to begin with, that we would permit this on a more permanent basis. I don't think it's gonna hold up well and look good even if we were, you know, uh, wanted to have this wall-like effect. As far as the pattern that was originally chosen, the pattern is certainly better than brick or uh, a, a black uh, vinyl, but the whole idea is not the direction. I agree with other commissioners. We need to look for something with your transparency uh, and a sense of not being a permanent wall uh, in a, a block of, uh, you know, that has no penetration of light and uh, no penetration of view. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I agree with much of what's been said in terms of, uh, uh, of the inappropriateness of, of the uh, graphic. Uh, I, I, I'm with, uh, Mr. Gustafson, in terms of the uh, his view on uh, that it should be open and um, uh, it should not be blocked, uh, you know, 
chain link as a material for playgrounds is, is very common in New York City, uh, but it's always open and it always allows, allows people to see. And that's part of the street life of, of New York City. It's part of the street life of Greenwich Village, where there's, a, you know, there's several very f famous uh, basketball courts, uh, playgrounds that are fenced with chain link and where seeing that activity is part of the uh, life of the street. So I would not think that any kind of uh, uh, material that block that would be appropriate. I mean, this site has uh, uh, brick walls around it. That's a feature of this particular site. Uh, if they wanted opacity, I think they've got a template for how to do it. Uh, I certainly, I, I think that if the graphic were removed, I, I, I think that chain link as a grandfathered material uh, could be extended up if it were consistent with the rest of the fencing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of the graphic. Thank you. Com uh, Commissioner Devonshire. I'm okay with the ex extension of the height uh, to keep the basketballs from going out into the street. They cost 50 bucks a piece. Um, I am absolutely not okay with the vinyl. I think if they need some kind of semi-privacy, they could put a neutral mesh and mount it on the inside of the chain link fence. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I think that uh, it doesn't seem like the, um, the the majority, uh, you know, I, I don't think the, 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 the project can be supported as it is right now. Okay. All right. So I think um, where we are is we have um, support for raising, extending the fence at the basketball portion, extending the height of the chain link fence, but we do not have support on the any. Um, covering at this point. And there are also concerns with the additional signs on top of the covering. And I think that the issues with the covering really have to do with the opacity and the graphic and that the applicant could I think there's some openness to something while a preference to have it open, some openness to something by some commissioners if it were a more neutral toned down um, pattern, color and um, if there was more um, openness to it, whether that's perforations, cutouts, or uh, sort of more of a translucent fabric. So um, I think right now what I'd like to do, even though this is technically a violation, I'd like to take no action because I feel that the applicant didn't really get to speak today um, with, you know, without the sort of she was a little uncomfortable because she couldn't hear us at the same time. So I'd like to take no action and allow them, her to continue to work with the staff um, on deciding whether or not to eliminate the vinyl covering or to try to design something that responds to the comments and then come back to us. Um, and we can revisit at some point where we could prove the extension of the fence and to the extent that there is comfort with a redesigned uh, covering, we can um, consider that at the time at that time as well. So let's um, take no action today and we'll ask the staff to continue to work with Ms. Nielsen on the application. Okay. Thank you. Before you're breaking up, uh, moving to the next hearing item, item number four. Okay. Oh, no, PC 20 PC 20 and application, application for a certificate of appropriateness for the road not had in 232 or 446 Broadway and Soho. Excuse me, a second, I'm starting to read next item. item. I'm going to go back, back and just go start, start with it. Yeah. Oh, PC 20-03-507, application for certificate of appropriateness for the road. I had 586, lot 15, 16, Roy Roy Street, and Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2. We've got a lot of stuff on the house, but it's really 1835. The application is from structure and regulation, and it's also in the panels and the skyline. 
Okay, so again, uh, this was um, an application for 16 Leroy Street, docket number 20-03507. And um, before we begin the presentation, I just wanted to let the public know this is the time to call in if you wish to speak on this application and we will display the meeting information again and when we commence the public testimony. Um, but with that, Edith, can you turn it over to the applicants? Yes, the applicant now has uh, the screen and please state your name for the record and you may begin. Great. Hello, my name is Ben Asher and I'm the architect of record for the project. Uh, thank you for allowing us to present today. Um, as you know, 16 Leroy Street is a brick townhouse constructed in 1835 with Greek revival features, and Italian alterations uh, with an existing three-story rear extension that was added at a later date. Uh, the owners will be returning the building back to a single family dwelling. Uh, the project scope will include replacing the existing rear extension with a two story uh, addition, uh, a roof solar panel installation, as well as a roof skylight on the primary facade, which they'll also be restoring as part of their application at the staff level. Now, the only location through which this rear extension will be visible in the skylight, I mean, I'm sorry, in the solar panels will be visible is through the lot at 31 Carmine Street, which I'm showing here, mm -hmm. looking through, and here's 16 Leroy with the proposed two-story extension across, which you can see in the block diagram. I wanted to point that out. And then from here, we can see the view of the existing from Carmine Street with a rectangle showing what portions of the building would be visible. Um, our proposal is to um, create a new rear extension by uh, removing the existing three-story extension, which you see here, which uh, we're doing for two reasons. One, um, the existing extension is, we've noted is deteriorating behind the vinyl siding um, both on the construction of, of the exterior, but also we've noted some interior um, deterioration as well. And then the other reason is for design reason, um, we find that uh, the, the new proposed two-story extension will create a better utilization of the interior space. And we wanted to note that the existing three-story extension also does not align, the floors do not align with the main uh, structure, which also creates some um, problematic uh, situations with its use. These are just some context photos. This is a 1940s photo. This is existing. And then this is the rear extension side by side with the existing. And I wanna just kind of move forward to, this is a, a view um, from Carmine Street. So you can see side by side on the left what we're proposing and on the right, what is existing. And then on this screen, um, it's a little hard to see, but this line here denotes a mock-up of where the two-story extension would be in its height. And then the photo in the middle um, is superimposed what the proposed extension would look like and, and with the sky and the roof, um, solar panels on the roof and on the right, um, demonstrates what's there existing now. Now to talk about the merits of the design. Um, so the, the proposed two-story extension will be a new brick facade over a steel frame. Um, the brick would be to match the existing brick. Um, the extension, would be, as we said before, is two stories high and will be aligned with the existing extension at 18 Leroy Street, which I'm showing here. Uh, the top will be covered in a bluestone parapet cap, which we believe would be appropriate for the time period. Um, all of the doors and windows uh, will be replaced and the, those proposed will be uh, custom uh, wood units with insulated glass trim and muttons and historic profile with true divided lights and all of which will be painted Benjamin Moore HC27 Monterey White, which we also believe is an appropriate color. The facade uh, proposed will also include two um, terrace doors shown here with half round transoms above them 
a brick arch with a blue keystone uh, on, on top. And these are proposed in reference to um, some arches that we've seen on 32 Carmine Street, which is visible from this facade, and also some other um, features in the neighborhood that's recurring themes that the owner found appealing and wanted to work into this. Uh, above the extension uh, on the second and third floor, we're planning on replacing um, what were existing windows and uh, a door at, at the existing terrace with new terrace um, doors at the second level and uh, double hung three over three windows, um, all of which would be within the existing masonry openings and maintaining these existing wood, um, sorry, brick arches that are here and shown on the cursor. Moving up to the roof level, uh, we intend to install low profile solar panels, uh, which will be neon to black by LG. Um, these are only extending seven inches above the existing roof plane and they are a consistent black color for uniformity. Now moving through to the primary facade. There we go. Uh, we're also intending on the primary street facade to install a 15 foot three by 16 foot nine skylight, which will consist of 15 panels, two rows of five fixed over one row of operable. And I wanted to point out that the entire assembly only extends three and a half inches above the existing roof plane. So it is below the visibility line, sight line from the public view, which is depicted here with this dotted line. But be that as it may, we've also noted um, that there are other uh, examples of skylights having been added to um, townhouses at this time period in this historic uh, district. So I'd put that out there as well. Um, that pretty much concludes what I was gonna say about this. I was gonna turn it back over to you guys for questions. So we have a lot of other details I can go through and answer if you have any questions on it. I cannot hear anybody. Sorry, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? If you raise your hand, I will recognize you. Okay. Not seeing, oh, I see Commissioner Jefferson has a question. Yeah. Um, just one question, if I may. Um, the solar panels, um, have you given any thought to the Tesla shingles that have been marketed now so that it, it would be part of the structure and a good part of the structure forever and would do what you wanted to do in terms of energy? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. We did investigate some of the Tesla solar panels. The problem that I've been having with them, and this has been a recurring issue um, since they first started talking about them, is that they're not yet available to be sold here in New York, is what we were informed. And we still don't know what that date would be. And the owners want to do this project now and not have to wait another year or two and then redo the entire roof, which is the one drawback to the Tesla panels is that when they do become fully available, you would have to do a complete roof replacement in order to, uh, to do that, that work. And they would want to do this work as part of the rest of the renovation um, here in 2020. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Halford Smith. Uh, yes, I wasn't, I'm not sure if I missed this, but the um, skylight at, on the front um, roof is not visible from any location? Yes, that is correct. Um, and actually, let me take you to a, an earlier portion of the presentation, which I kind of blew right through, it is a better vantage point. Um, so you can see in the lower uh, portion of LPC 100.00, you can see a scale figure, and this is a good indication to show what that sight line would be. 
we also have photos um, mock it and we did a mock up for the staff as well. So they can verify that as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Not seeing any other questions at this time. We'll move to public testimony. Lisa. Okay, great. Um, we had two people sign up. Um, we'll start with Kelly Carroll from Historic Districts Council. Kelly, we've brought you into our room and unmuting you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can, Kelly. Thank you. Um, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Great. Uh, Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. As this presentation displays minimal visibility studies, HDC has concerns regarding the visibility of the proposed large skylight on the front facade. The skylight, if visible, is a drastic change that might be better concealed from pedestrian view with the restoration of the building's original cornice configuration. Therefore, we suggest restoring this condition to further eliminate visibility of the proposed skylight. Thank you. All right, Lisa, okay. is there anyone? Uh, next person, else? yes, sorry about that. Um, next person is Sarah Bean Atman. Um, Sarah, bringing you into our room. Okay, Sarah, um, I've unmuted you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hold on, I'm turning down my YouTube on my tablet. I'm multiple tasking here. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Sarah. All set? Yep, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Okay, Sarah Bean Atman of Village Preservation. Um, Leroy Street boasts some of the oldest houses in the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2. Number 16 was built as part of a row in 1835, and it and number 20 still retain their original massings, fenestration, attic window openings, and pitched roofs. Such special buildings should be treated as such, um, but unfortunately, some of the proposed changes to number 16 failed to do so. Firstly, converting the front roof to nearly all glass does little to honor this original pitched roof. It is difficult to believe that it would not be visible from the street by anyone of average height, not to mention the light go that the glow that will emanate from it during the nighttime. As to the very visible rear addition, we do appreciate the relative modesty of its depth and height, as well as the use of brick cladding. However, the French doors with round arch transoms are completely out of place on this early Greek revival house and would be better suited for perhaps a colonial revival structure. Additionally, they lend a monumentality to the rear, which has no place on this modest row house. Finally, while we do not object to solar panels per se, we feel that the ones proposed and what was presented at Community Board 2 um, are very glossy. It is our understanding that there are solar panels available, which would be better suited. I know the applicant addressed this, but I'd like that explored further, or we would like that explored further. Um, uh, we'd like something more suited to this historic structure. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I'm removing you now, but you can rejoin for the, your next item. Okay. Um, we have two um, other people in the waiting room. Um, I believe they might be for later items, but um, I think we should probably try to admit them. Okay, Roger Friedman, can you hear me? Roger Friedman. Okay, um, Roger Friedman, last time. Doesn't look like he has okay. any audio. Yeah, so Roger Friedman, if you're listening on YouTube, please um, join the meeting only for the item that you plan to testify for. And Brian Lurie. Brian Lurie, I've unmuted you. Are you here to testify on 16 Leroy Street? And Brian Lurie. 
Brian, can you turn down your YouTube um, sound? And are you here to testify for 16 Leroy Street? Brian, Larry, I've unmuted you. Are you here to testify no. for 16 Leroy Street? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I thought I got out of this. Uh, I'm for 6668 West 10th you Street. Down your YouTube? Okay, so please just call back for that one when it's called. Not. I, I thought I was out of this already. I'm sorry. No. Okay, thank you. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I... Okay, I believe that's everybody um, for okay. the item. All right, Rich, do we have a resolution from the community board? Yes, we do have the resolution from the community board. Uh, they approved and denied in part uh, approval of the front facade, approval of the demolition of the existing extension, denial of the facade of the extension, and denial of the solar panels. And we also have one additional uh, letter in opposition from another community member. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to turn back to the applicant and see if you wanna to respond to some of the comments um, that were made in the testimony or at the community board. Okay, um, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, first off, um, addressing some of the ones for the community board, which I have uh, some of the things here. Um, the, the main uh, focus that I remember from the community board was they had an issue with, and let me zoom through here. If I have access to, oh, I can't get back control of the presentation. Okay, well, on our presentation, um, they had objected to the blank space, oh, thank you, um, shown on our proposed facade uh, between the tops of the arch windows and the um, bluestone parapet cap. Um, because they thought that it needed a little more articulation. Um, but the, our preservationists in talks with us, and we agree with our preservationists, had, at one point we had thought about having uh, a busier uh, facade at that point, but uh, the preservationists, and we agreed as well, thought that a simpler, um, uh, well, I don't know who's scrolling through here, but thank you for, for this would be a perfect one to stop at. Um, had felt that this would be a, a, a simpler solution would be better here. So that's why we had left it kind of a blank between the, or just brick rather, between the bluestone carpet cap and the um, arches below. Um, the other objection I believe they had had was at the basement level um, and what we were doing there. But uh, this, improve the functionality of what they wanted to have access from the basement out to a lower terrace, uh, which is why we have the double door there. And then we have a secondary door for more, um, you know, basic functions of taking uh, things in and out of the back um, for, um, you know, trash and so forth. Um, but the, uh, the main important point of why we left it the way it is, is that this level of the basement level is not visible by anyone. It is well below the visibility line, which is actually um, denoted on this rear facade uh, at about the midpoint of the um, terrace doors with the arch transoms. So that was one of the reasons we kind of kept um, our design below that level. And then lastly, they were concerned about the sky, not the skylights, the um, solar panels. And as we addressed before, um, you know, I would, you know, we, we looked into the Tesla ones, but they're just not available yet as a viable solution. I'm sure they will be in a year or two, but they don't seem to be at this moment. I'm eagerly anticipating them as well. Um, and uh, we could not find another substitute um, other than something of, about, about this, this type of panel. And one of the reasons we chose this one is because it's uniform um, color as opposed to some other ones which are a little busier with a few different colors of uh, metal and uh, black material. So this one we chose because it was the most uniform and low profile. Um, and I, I don't know what other ones we need to address. Um, I guess someone had mentioned something about the front facade. I do want to point out that the skylight, um, we did go through uh, a phase where we did a mock-up for the preservationists so they could see what um, the skylight would be like on the roof. And we walked up and down the street and we were not able to see any at any point point the, um, the skylight mock-up, so therefore the skylight itself would not be visible. 
and you can talk to the preservationists about that as well, if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any final questions, commissioners, about any aspect of the application? Um, okay, and does everybody um, understand the visibility through the back? Okay. Can you go to the front facade for a second? All right. Sorry, we're just having some difficulty getting through the slides. Okay. All right. And Commissioner, Commissioner Goldblum, did you have a question or you're good? Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Please go ahead. About the, the concept of modesty and the arch windows, um, does it matter? We were discussing Rockefeller Center and we were discussing what happened before, what was there before, um, this change of scale. And here we have a modest uh, donut building and it's being changed to something much, I mean, quite elegant. Is there any concern with that, or maybe I'm not looking at it right? So, uh, well, I'll let you know what we've done in the past. The commission has historically allowed a little more flexibility on rear facades, um, largely because you know we really don't allow um, a lot of flexibility on the rear if the historic can, on the front if the historic condition is intact. So. Um, in most many cases, when the rear is not visible from a public thoroughfare, the commission has approved a great amount of flexibility in terms of design. Um, and when it is visible from a public thoroughfare, and this does have a, a, a limited, but it does have a view corridor um, where you see mostly the upper floors, but I think you do catch some of that parlor floor. And um, so that's, why this is before us in terms of its design, but the commission tends to look at um, scale and character more than design per se. So, you know, does it have the scale and character of a row house? And so sometimes we have seen rear facades that are highly designed and limestone, and we've had concerns about them being too formal for a rear facade. But in terms of just the design of a two-story rear extension, we've been fairly flexible. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So let's um, move to close the hearing and move into our discussion. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Luffy, would you second that? Second. Okay, and in a minute, I will have everyone unmuted and we can vote. Okay, all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so hearing is closed and we'll move into a discussion. And um, so there's really, there's the new two-story rear yard addition, um, which, does seem to match the height of another addition in the block. Um, it is, as described, visible. So the design uh, of the top, the parlor floor of the addition is also something we'll look at in addition to the window configuration and the solar panels and the skylights on the front, which the applicant and the staff have confirmed are not visible from a public way. So um, with that, why don't we start with uh, Michael Goldblum, Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this one and we'll move around? Sure. Um, I think that in terms of the rear addition, it's funny, you know, the comments of, uh, of uh, GBSHP. When I first looked at the arches, I had the same reaction, you know, it seems so aggrandized, but then I thought about it and I, I thought that that's kind of an example of 
maybe may, I, I can't speak for, for Ms. Atman, but for, for myself, I, I think it, it was an example of um, a bias against classical architecture. You know, kind of a, pre, a, a presumption that had a similarly frontal designed grander uh, modern one been shown as 99% of them usually are, I think it wouldn't have caused me uh, a pause. I think the fact that it's a classical language that is different from the classical language of the building um, struck an odd note, but I, I don't think that that's fair. I think that um, uh, there are many examples that we've seen over time of rear yard additions that have been made in the 1920s, 1930s, <clears throat> and later uh, on the Upper East Side and other districts where a different uh, traditional architectural language is used uh, for um, modifications to an older townhouse. So I, I don't think there's any concern with that. Uh, for me, um, I think, this, I think the um, solar panels are uh, well within the bounds of what we have approved in the past. They're uh, simply laid out, they're symmetrical, they're uh, relatively unobtrusive. If there were a matte version, that'd be great, but I don't think that's particularly problematic as shown. I do have a concern about the extent of the skylights on the front facade. I understand that they're not visible, uh, but I think that in the case of a federal building of this vintage, um, it's, you're removing the majority of the front roof and uh, on the front facade of the building. And, um, and, it, and it's being done in a way that is not consistent with how front facades of, of roofed buildings of this vintage have been modified in the past, uh, whether that's a north light or a dormer. Um, it's just a series of of, of what look like store-bought skylights in, a, in an array, it just doesn't, and I know that it can't be seen, but I think that that for a front facade of a building of this vintage, I think we should we could appropriately take a higher standard and, and ask for the skylight to be revisited as something that would be more appropriate to its uh, type and uh, uh, location. So would you be comfortable though with just a skylight that isn't as wide or as tall that doesn't cover the entire slope? Mm -hmm. Yeah. sort of along the lines of how we look at dormer, new shed dormers on, on uh, yeah. pitched roofs. Okay, yeah. all right. Commissioner Chapin, and if you could think about that suggestion of reducing the size of that skylight as well in your comments. Oh, where are you? Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I uh, I do um, approve the use of the um, you know the uh, uh, solar panels, and I I think I agree with uh, Commissioner Goldblum's comments about the design. We usually give a lot of latitude to the rear design. Um, I think that his point about the um, skylight is well taken. That uh, while it's not visible, it is a lot of historic. Um, it, it's it's very it's unhistoric as as presented, and uh, having it uh, working with the staff to reduce the size of the skylight to something more appropriate uh, seems to me uh, reasonable in this instance. So I think that's uh, that's where I would be at on the application in general. I could approve it. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, where are you? Hang on. Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost you here. Hang on. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I, I agree with the previous uh, comments from commissioners. I think um, my initial reaction to, to the Arch windows was very similar to um, what Commissioner Goldblum said, and I think if it were a modern vocabulary, I wouldn't have had that that same issue. But um, I can accept it um, as a rear a rear addition, and I had the same uh, concern about the skylight in the front. I think it needs to be um, scaled down. 
Otherwise, Thank uh, everything else is acceptable. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm in agreement with what's been said. I, I'm not, um, I, th I think it's fine to reduce the size of the skylights, but I would like to see them not there at all, even if I don't see them. Um, but I, I would support it with the reduction. Okay. All right, and Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, start, starting with the uh, rear yard addition, um, I, I think we should um, first commend the applicant. I mean, we're taking away a uh, uh, structure that's got vinyl siding on it, which I'm sure we're all going to miss dearly, um, and we're replacing it with a uh, with a shorter um, extension that is the height and depth of the neighboring building. I think that is about as uh, respectful and decent as they can be. Um, we have approved much more radical designs on such rear yard extensions, so I'm not concerned about the, um, the arches. Um, as far as the uh, uh, solar panels are concerned, I'm, they're, they're, I'm fine with that, no issue whatsoever. And I agree with the other commissioners about the skylight. I would, I would you know, considering how much of the, uh, if that uh, roof that's gonna take up, I think it should be reduced somewhat, otherwise I'm fine. Okay, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yes, I, I agree with Commissioner Goldblum's comments. Okay, and Commissioner Lutfi? I'm in agreement as well. Okay. Commissioner Bland? Well, for another minority report, um, I um, have nothing against classical architecture, but when applied to a federal building, even then in the rear, I, I object to it. I think it's a wrong move. Um, I think another, and, and just because it's in the neighborhood somewhere else doesn't make it appropriate here in, the, in a somewhat invisible backyard. Um, so I, I can't go along with that. And I think, I think um, meeting the exact alignment with the neighbor is also actually a wrong move. Nice move, as uh, as Commissioner Gustafson just said, but uh, you know, a federal building should be respected as its own thing. It's not part of a pastiche uh, in this case, and I I just I think those are two wrong moves: the classical um, addition and the exact alignment. I think a federal house should kind of stand alone, and I bet that um, I bet that rear addition. Was probably initially a two-story addition, and most federal houses had them uh, at, the, at that level. And so, anyway, I can support something else, but I'm in the minority. Um, I think the the, uh, the a reduction in the front um, um, skylights is is something that should be achieved, and maybe this won't built for, be built for another year or two. So uh, maybe by then the Tesla shingles will be uh, available and we can hope that uh, that as opposed to what's being proposed will be, um, will be what's put on the uh, roof in the rear. But, but I guess I can approve it if they're really gonna start building it right away. Yeah, yeah, but and also the Tesla would require replacing the whole roof. I mean, they are roof shingles, so this is- No, I understand. Yeah. Okay, um, and Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree. At the minimum, the uh, skylight at the front, even if it's invisible, is superior to the smoke from the Okay. And Commissioner Devonshire. I'm I'm aligned with Fred with regard to that rear addition. I mean, we're taking a a federal building and turning it into something completely different. I also, I agree with my colleagues about the reduction of the, the front facade skylight. Um, I guess with regard to the solar panels, there isn't much we can actually use as another option. Um, I, I have to take, not really offense, but I, I have to say, Eight years ago, I had a Columbia student who did her thesis on vinyl siding, and I gained a new appreciation for it, only moderate appreciation. <laughs> and, and so I have to say something about John's remarks about vinyl siding. It is a very interesting material, and uh, I love to see it when it gets tossed in the dumpsters. 
<laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. Um, okay. So I think it, we, I know uh, Commissioner Bland and Commissioner Devonshire have concerns about the design of the rear yard addition, um, but I think we otherwise have enough votes for it as is and a consensus that the skylights should be reduced in height and width working with the staff to allow a, more of a sense of the original buildings roof. So I think we can make a motion with that. And I'm going to ask um, Commissioner Goldblum if you will make that motion. Sure. Uh, regarding 16 Leroy Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2, the application is to construct a rewrite addition and install solar panels on a skylight. I recommend a, um, approval with modifications. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2. Um, I recommend approval with it. Those modifications, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate any significant features of the building. The proposed one-story rear yard addition will match the height and depth of the addition at the neighboring building at 18 Leroy Street and will not substantially eliminate the presence of rear yarders, diminish the central green space. The design and materiality of the proposed addition featuring red brick cladding, punched openings, and wood trim will be harmonious with the building and historic district. That the proposed addition will only be visible in part from limited vantage points through, the break, through a break in the street wall on Carmine Street, that the low profile rectilinear configuration, dark color and uniform appearance of the solar panel array will have a neutral presence on the visible rear slope of the roof while being clearly identifiable as a reversible modern installation. That the proposed skylight on the roof, uh, front slope of the roof will not be visible from a public thoroughfare and that its installation will not extend full width and length of the roof, maintaining the framing and exposure of the historic pitch roof on all sides. That the work will not detract from special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2. However, the applicant will work with staff to uh, uh, reduce the size of the skylights uh, facing the front facade to make it more uh, consistent with historic precedent for such openings, um, period. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you Second that motion? Second. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Yes, let's, thank you. Let's, let's keep Commissioner Chen muted until you call his name, just because of the background noise. It's hard to hear the other votes. Okay. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Nay. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen, I will unmute you. Aye. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, 10 in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. All right, that's approved. So we are a little behind schedule, but it is um, one o'clock. So I'm going to break for lunch now and we'll return at 1.30 and we'll pick up with 446 Broadway um, right after lunch and continue the agenda in the order uh, uh, as presented on the agenda. Okay, so we'll see you in a half hour commissioners. Just turn your video and sound off. Um, and then when you return, turn your video on.